Justin, do you have a, a favorite arcade game that has not yet been mentioned? <sighs> mm, no, because I really like the X Men one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I I actually got to uh, finally play through Smash TV though. Oh uh, yeah, I love that mm. one. Yeah, when I, at the arcade I was mentioning because it's you know you pay the 15 bucks and then you just get to keep playing and so i didn't have to worry about just throwing all the quarters into it like i would have before oh, nice and so i got to actually experience the whole game so that was one that was always at the pizza hut that you'd get to go to <laughs> yes okay, like, I like just gonna... yeah you would get to go there as a treat if you did your book it so this is aging yeah. me <laughs> and, <laughs> and you get a free Stop. kid's pizza and, Stop. right and they had a, yeah, exactly. And they had Smash TV there. And so you'd get, mm. I, our treat was we got 50 cents. So we got to play it once. So you barely ever got past, like, yep. you know, the first 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> but then if you somehow had got other quarters or something, then you could play a little more. But yeah, it was never more than a level. And so it was, it was fun. Man, never has there been a boon to the effort of education like Book It. Yeah. We had Book It Up in Canada. It read so diligently because of Book It. Nice. Mm-hmm. I've actually had some friends uh, who have suggested that we should try and come up with some version, like a, as adults, we should have a version of Book It just on our own. And granted, we can all just go pay for our <laughs> own pizza now, but just for the nostalgia <laughs> and almost like a book club. when you're an adult club. millennial, you have to gamify self-care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. Mythos Busters, investigating the mystery, monsters, and madness of Arkham Horror, the card game. Hello and welcome to episode 136 of Mythos Busters. I'm Sean, joining me tonight is the full crew. We've got Scott. Hello. Hey Scott, this is the second time I've introduced you tonight. What are your feelings? Oh, happiness, uh, contentness. Uh, fullness now because I had a snack. Um, nice. Yeah. Satiated. How about that? I dig it. I dig it. Ready to like get loose and talk Arkham? Yeah, I'm really excited for for this new format because like I can I can come in knowing like tonight is just a full on night of Arkham. You know, it's not like mm-hmm. a little dabble of two hours. It's like I'm coming in for five six hours. Here we go. You know, like <laughs> let's have I sign in and we end off whatever. Our our former recordings of th- two plus hours are just are merely an aperitif nowadays. <laughs> yeah, wafer thin mints compared to <laughs> the recording nights of today. Now we gorge until we explode. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Ian. And there's the I'm Indian. glad you got Ian. that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's only wafer thin. <laughs> now I feel like I'm recording from the past, like time capsule, because we're gonna release this one um like a few weeks from now a couple weeks from now so speaking to you from the depths of the past now who like who the hell knows what the world is gonna look like at the end of august (laughs) 2022 it could be like you know 2020 onward has prepared us for anything so i for one uh welcome our alien overlords Mm -hmm. we might have like five more pandemics by then (laughs) <laughs> or will I, or will accidentally say something that ages horribly yeah, oh, yeah. No. yeah. that's the more likely thing <laughs> hey justin uh okay so uh oh, also there, there's justin sorry i got yeah no, I, said, I, I said i said hey justin oh, okay. he's there he's there with us I they guess. know i'm here hi everyone <laughs> always somebody's watching me all right, so we've got an extra fun episode for you guys tonight. As we've mentioned uh, leading up to this, we've got our new format, uh, episode 135 and 136 recorded in the same session. 135 was a kind of a more standard episode, and we've got a really fun, loose, conversational 136 for you. We're going to get caught up on some voicemails. Uh, we got a little bit of rules to catch up with, uh, uh, with Scott. Our discussion topic tonight is going to be just a, a nice, loose casual state of the game discussion because i don't think we've had one since like dream eaters i want to say it was a while ago yeah it's time yeah it's prepare yourself for hot takes because i feel like that's what it all always devolves into (laughs) it's just (laughs) who can have the hottest take yeah who's shooting from the hip the best today yeah (laughs) 
And then, of course, we'll round this one out with some tentacle time. But before we get to any of that, uh, we, we kind of skipped it at the beginning of last episode because we wanted to get to our card previews. Uh, so if you haven't checked those out, we previewed a couple cards on Twitch a month back, and we just previewed a couple cards in our, our previous episodes to so check out 135 if you haven't already uh, for some preview cards from the Scarlet Keys. Uh, but guys, what have you been playing lately? What's your Arkham look like? Have we all been like desperately scrambling to play Edge so that we can talk about it? <laughs> I, I ask it as a question, but that's more an admission, really. I uh, I did play one with. Uh, I I like I quickly played through. Um, mm-hmm. I took Leo, and I had to try sled dogs. <laughs> and uh, it's the thing to do. Yeah, someone mentioned it in our previous episode in the in the chat about a Leo sled dogs uh, deck, and I was like, oh hey. Oh yeah, I did that one. <laughs> it was neat. Solo, it was interesting. Like the the cluing was a bit of a struggle. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't doubt. Movement was on lock though, so <laughs> that was good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, we just talked about this last episode, but like Edge is the is the campaign of stories, right? And the challenge, I don't think it's as hard. It's an average as of a challenge. Um, but weirdly enough, I didn't have a lot of crazy stories from this one. Like, it was just Leo and dogs going through the Arctic, doing mm-hmm. what was required of them, and then all suddenly the campaign's over. So, it was weird. So, so I also have an Edge Leo sled dog campaign. He's paired with Mandy. But, like, did you do what I did and, like, as quickly as you could kill off Alaya so that you could also get on you and have, like, the full team? Uh, no, I didn't even think of that. Because <laughs> I wouldn't kill a human for an animal, Sean. Uh, if that animal is on you, y'all better watch out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, no, I think on you, on you lived to the end in mine. Hmm. So, or sorry, the, no, on you's the dog, right? <laughs> we, we, we got a Duke Ashcan situation again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shit. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Aliyah lived to the end. Well, look, look, this is, this is, I just posted a picture. This is my Leo setup. So I had on you at the head of the pack and all four sled dogs out during my play mm. of, uh, uh, city of the elder oh things. And God. I was, I was living the dream <laughs> boys. Look, Mitch buried under there. You see Mitch He's yeah. like poking out time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Shut up, Mitch, get in the sled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So looking at this picture, I'm pretty sure like three turns into this, then I drew Leo's weakness and I didn't have anyone in my hand. Oh. Who do you get rid of? I mean, one of the sled dogs, right? I should have, but I got rid of on you. Mm. Why? I wanted to see. Uh, okay, so this this was me just like I want to see what all four sled dogs can do. Right. And really, all it was is make it so that I didn't really have to play out a, a weapon the entire scenario. So I guess there's that. Yeah. They're fun. They're fun. Psychopath, oh, psychopath asks if you. Asks, uh, yeah. If I included the star, no, not yet. But that's not a bad idea. I might go Ooh. one of on that for my next up upgrade. Okay, look, yeah, I mean, you get a lot of soak out of that, but, like, you've already got four two twos out. You have so much soak. <laughs> yeah, but imagine four three threes, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. That means each dog can take an additional 1-1 one, one hit. That's that's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. Num- numbers get big, big. <laughs> yeah. Do. That is more soak in dogs than an investigator has. Because that's, that's 12 and 12. Yeah, you've got, a, like, a whole-ass other investigator for the encounter. <laughs> and then to some. <laughs> yeah. even, even keeping them alive, it, they're 8-8. Eight, eight. Yeah, see. So you have a Stella. <laughs> you just have a spare Stella. Yeah, just a spare Stella, Stella that's only Soak, but also fights and moves you. Oh, man, it's so good. There you go. So I had been having trouble with that Leo build because in the in the games leading up to City of the Elder Things, I had never topped three dogs mm. uh, because the, the, the weakness had gotten in the way. Draw was bad, just like it never came together. Um, but in City of the Elder Things, I had gotten stick to the plan and I had ever vigilant on it because that's, that's what you do. Mm-hmm. And I flopped out uh, a Mitch a sled dog and a mineral specimen. And then I used calling in favors with Mandy at the same location. Mm. 
So she triggered his her ability to get two targets, and sure enough, I found both on you and another sled dog, <laughs> both of which I got to play out for free because they're the same cost as the sled dog I pulled back to my hand. It was just, it was the nuts. Oh, wow. I'll never do it again, but uh, that that was a fantastic opening turn. Wow, living the dream. Mm-hmm. Ian, how about you? <laughs> Desperately playing Edge as well. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I I think as I've mentioned several times had a bunch of edge campaigns that I was leaving unfinished and so it's been my solemn vow to go back and finish them even if I started and left them um, hanging like months ago (laughs) so I've stopped doing the thing where I restart campaigns I finished uh, Luke and Daniela's (laughs) campaign uh, which they didn't get all the pylons collapsed but they did manage to escape so that was kind of an up and down campaign it was a little bit of an interesting duo Uh, but then I also finished up and played through most of my time has been finishing up that solo Preston edge campaign that I talked about last oh. time. Mm. Um, Hashtag which, freeze the rich. Yeah. <laughs> to, to, to my shock and horror, he survived and beat the campaign handily. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. Really? <laughs> yeah. I, I have been um, vocal that Preston is my least favorite rogue um, but it's oh. never really been about his me thinking he's a bad investigator. It's more so like not quite jiving. Like you know, I like my mobile of eighty rogues, uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that kind of that kind of style. And Preston is a little bit different. But I have to say, ah, so you I, like rogues with stats? Yeah, I do. Um, but I have to say, I was compared to my TCU solo experience. My solo Preston Edge experience, I was super impressed. Like, every scenario Ooh. that I can think of. You were impressed in? Yeah, I was impressed in. Um, he pretty much handled pretty handily. Even I played uh, the final scenario, Heart of Madness, over the past couple of days. And he just, he smashed through the five pylons with not that much trouble. He's able to Okay, escape. how, though? How? um yeah one is fire axe fire axe that's one part of it another piece is lola santiago just scoop clues off another piece is upgraded streetwise of course and then the other piece Mm. is the mariner's compass like those four cards Mm. are pretty much the heart of the deck that's a kit and do most of it and then i managed to upgrade into the uh super red clock the upgraded and I'm not even doing any funky tricks like I did with Jenny with it. It's just a strong card that just gives you value throughout the game. So, yeah, but with those cards and then um, just a few interesting ones that I popped in here and there. Uh, but really, that those core four cards just did everything that I needed to do throughout the campaign. So setting your class consciousness aside. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the uh, important part. Is, is, is Preston still at the bottom, or have, have you gained a new love for him? Oof. Well, the problem is I don't know who I would move down into that slot I was just going to say. Preston like, up. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, Preston moved I, up, but there was a vacuum in front of him. Right. <laughs> right. Okay, so you're a Finn main. I am. And Skids still beats Preston. Uh, hmm. Skid, you know, Skids has some funky builds like the uh, mm, what's mm, what's your mm. name for it, Scott? Again, I'm I'm no, oh. I'm blanking on oh, it right now. Anti aircraft gun Skids. Yeah, yeah, like that style. <laughs> um, Ballista Skids. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. It it would probably be Skids, but yeah, I I don't know how to how to rank it now. But I just know that in terms of like raw strength, um, I'm very impressed at the point. Preston has gotten to solo in particular. Like I knew he could do things in multiplayer, but solo, like you're still going to get hosed by willpower, but that just tends to Mm -hmm. be true for even my beloved Finn. So it just, it is what it is. You're going to get hosed by a lot of treacheries playing Preston. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, But because of the survivor axis, you're able to get like lots of soaks. So, so that helps um, that that's kind of the other piece of the puzzle, I guess. So, just a lot of soaks mm-hmm. out to help with that and and yeah i was able th- this was the campaign though that i was talking about and our past episode in episode 135 where i racked up 
an insane amount of uh, Tekka uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. So I was, I played through Ice and Death, and I was free and clear, and I was happy. I don't think there was a single Tekka I decided to go into Fatal Mirage um, at some point, and that's where it started <laughs> spiraling out of control. And I, I went into Heart of Madness with 10 Tekka in my solo deck, and I managed <laughs> to get even more. So I think there was only like three Tekalilis left in the deck, and the rest were in my in my Preston deck. I was like a good amount of um, way into the scenario, and I looked at how many cards were in my deck, and it was like still thirty something <laughs> because of all the Tekalilis wow. in there. But wow. managed to survive that <laughs> onslaught, thankfully. <clears throat> And which ending did you ultimately arrive at? Um, that's when I got the uh, the Kensler uh, entity ending. So, mm-hmm. yeah. But yeah, the, I, I did a lot of work with Streetwise. So if you take out the upgraded Streetwise, maybe my opinion goes down a little bit. I'm not. I, I still would have some tools, but yeah, it'd be a little dicier. And see, Ian, I'm so curious now to see when we finally get around to doing the next iteration of March to Madness. Mm what uh, this is going to do to your brain if we have to seed or if Rogue comes mm. up against Rogue now that suddenly Preston is a little more in play than he's been in the past, <laughs> in your opinion. Mm-hmm. I always love the investigators that just, like, they play like no one else. Mm-hmm. So, so Preston survivors? is... No. Well, <laughs> Preston is, is arguably my favorite Rogue. Mm. I do also have a soft spot for Winnie, oh. uh, mm-hmm. but I, I love me some Preston. Winnie and Preston are like polar opposites. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I, I do find the rhythm of Preston interesting, particularly if you are doing like the Fire Axe Mariner's Compass stuff, which you probably are, and like mm-hmm. figuring out when are you spending through your your actual resource pool versus family inheritance, and when do you want to like build up your resource pool a little bit for future turns. So yeah, it's a little bit interesting rhythm there. I think Trish might be my favorite rogue now. Okay, that's fair. I've been dabbling around with Trish, like, for solo, just... <laughs> Trish, Trish is good in, like, every player count. It's yes, a, like, but she's especially in solo. Like, it just... Mm-hmm. Everything gets cranked to the max in solo with her. I, I feel like it's almost not even a, mm-hmm. a, a challenge. Ooh. As far All as, right, like, so... solo solo rogues, like, versus Trish, like, I don't know who else mm-hmm. I would... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we almost played the Speed Sisters through our, our speedrun campaign. I, I was, mm-hmm. like, I was going to play Trish, like, up till the night before until I switched to Monterey. Yeah. <laughs> She's very, very good. Mm-hmm. Justin, how about you? I know we've talked a lot about our, our Edge campaign. You playing any other Arkham? I am not at the moment. It's just been kicking that off again. It's been a busy summer over here, so it's good to get back into it. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I am enjoying that we're playing that with our our buddy Brian, who does not play much Arkham in general. So he, um, I'm trying to remember what we ran through with him before. I think we did like standalone Rougarou or something, and it had been a couple years. And, yeah, the, we, and the card we... pool was much smaller. So it's nice that he can now come back, and we're having him jump in playing as Nacho, where he, I mean, he wants to smash things. And so you can do that anyway, but then you do it in such a different way with the way mm-hmm. you can build him, that it seems like he's digging it a little more. Mm-hmm. And also, like, Brian's one of those players that was hard to get to the table, and he once gained the werewolf, uh, the monstrous transformation uh, asset from, <laughs> from Rougarou, and we'll always mention that when we talk about Arkham. So I just, like, this last time, I just threw it in his deck, because <laughs> if, if it keeps him at the table, then okay, yeah. it's a werewolf now. Small price yeah. to pay. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I am all for constructive cheating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How are you liking Winnie, Justin? Uh, I am enjoying her. Um, I had, let's see, I think I've only played her once before. And uh, my brother and I um, were playing through, I believe, Carcosa. And then he was playing as Stella. And so I was more <clears throat> helping him kind of manage what he was doing so i didn't get to spend as much time seeing what winnie could do if that makes sense Mm -hmm. uh and so yeah i've really enjoyed the uh the deck you had built for me thank you by the way 
Um, oh, of course. And just, yeah, getting to see her fire on all cylinders right away. So it's it's a it's a interesting mechanic. Uh, it's funny, though, because it also messes with my head a little bit of uh, I'm just always hesitant to want to burn through my deck. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's a little bit of like the residual Star Wars destiny uh, sure. of your your deck is your health yeah, mm-hmm. or, or part of it. Uh, one of the lost conditions, I guess. And so I'm like, wait, I can just keep going. I can just add more cards. This is amazing. Can't stop, won't stop. Yeah. So no, it's, she's really fun. Scott, was it you who, who was like, I'm just going to put so much draw in Winnie. I'll cycle through her deck so fast, I'll power a light bulb. Like, yeah. She can do it. Uh, was that me? Sounds like something I'd say. Hmm. But it sounds like something I'd do. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Well, Let's get caught up on some voicemails. If you haven't heard recently, we have the Mythos Busters hotline, which you can call into and leave us a comment, question, uh, discussion topic idea, anything you'd like to get in touch uh, with us for. That's 203-493-6984, or if it's easier, 203-493-MYTH. So first tonight, we have... Well, actually, it wasn't first, but Big Kahuna is listening live and is also, like, drifting to sleep. So let's get to his first. Hey, Busters. Big Kahuna here. First off, I'd like to say, hey, Justin. I'm glad to see a genuine seeker as a full-time host on the cast again. (laughs) Uh, Second, I've been doing a bit of thinking about the next Iron Man run. An idea occurred to me regarding Innsmouth, and I was wondering if it held water. What would happen if you played Innsmouth? Not in release order, but in chronological order. The biggest issue is mm. the memories you get in the present timeline scenarios impact the past timeline scenarios. I would fix that by assuming you have every memory when you go through the vanishing of Elena Harper, Devil Reef, and the Lair of Dagon. Now, I don't think that would be a great idea for an Iron Man run, but it could be fun to try. It's kind of like a reverse machete order, if you're familiar with that idea, for Star Wars. If anyone <laughs> does attempt this and find it entertaining, I propose we call it the Kahuna Order. <laughs> Assuming no one has proposed it before, and apologize if you have. That's all for this time. So, the biggest obstacle for me is I'm not sure what the fuck chronological order is. <laughs> <laughs> Step one. <laughs> Figure yeah. out the order. <laughs> Uh, you're not alone in that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd have to, I think it would cause more work in planning, but I like the idea because have you guys ever watched the movie Memento? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Do you ever watch it like normal? <laughs> like there's <laughs> on the DVD, there's a way to, uh, watch it in, in chronological order. Yeah. And it was a different experience. It was also not as good, but I don't think that would, that part would translate oh, right. to Arkham. Because um, that movie, you have to watch it in order for it to like make sense. Um, or not make sense, I guess that's the point. Anyways, uh, what I'm saying <laughs> is uh, I would be open to trying this. I don't know if I w- would do it for Iron Man. But yeah, I'd, I'd be open to trying this in that order. It's a neat idea. I especially mm-hmm. like the, the analogy with the Star Wars cut. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, yes, machete order is key. If yeah. you have youngins that you're going to show Star Wars to, look it up. It's worth your time. Also, let's let's not bury the lead there. The shout out for the secret love is appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> Big Kahuna, it's been a while since Tom was on. Big Kahuna has been asking for a seeker main for a long time, so I'm glad we can finally provide. I mean, Justin's a seeker in the streets, but based on who I've seen him play and enjoy, he's a rogue in the sheets. Ooh. <laughs> Eh, you know i mean <laughs> i'm also that person who <laughs> will right. play anything but also ursula is my fave so i mean you know i do i do love me some seekers though i do i i enjoy mystics more than i thought i would but yeah oh. if you had to tell me to pick one class and that's the only one i could ever play i would first off ask who are you and why do you think you can tell me that and then i would answer <laughs> seeker don't tell me what to do yeah you're not the boss of me. But yeah, it's it's interesting. Like, Innsmouth, but without the amnesia. Uh-huh. Uh, so so what is the order? So is it, it would be um, Vanishing of Elena Harper. Yes. Devil Reef. 
right y- yes <laughs> this is already hurting my brain <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, so Vanishing, Devil Reef, uh, Horror in High Gear is present timeline, right? So it would be a Light in the Fog. No, Light in the Fog is present timeline. So then it would be Order of Dagon. My brain is already tired from this exercise. And then <laughs> all the ones that we've missed in order. <laughs> okay, yes. There we go. Yeah, like after Layer, <laughs> you get thrown into the hole for um, mm-hmm. Pit of Despair. That's right. Yeah, I think more than inter- anything, it'd just be interesting to play and see if it changes the narrative experience at all of, like, starting there and, like, playing Pit, like, partway through. I don't know. Mm. Vanishing, mm. Devil Reef, Lair of Dagon, Pit of Despair, Into Deep, Horror and High Gear, Light in the Fog, Into the Maelstrom. Mm. Yep. I mean, sure. Base, you sure. kind of, like, <laughs> intermittently suck three scenarios out and put them at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I mean, sure. Which is by far the weirdest sentence I've said today. <laughs> wow, made it to like 10 p.m. Good job. I know, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that'd be interesting. Um, also, then you wouldn't have to like do the XP dance. Yes. Mm. Interesting. Which is my least favorite, my least favorite part about Insmith. But also, it like only matters for like a single scenario because like twice it's like don't spend it yet and then right before you start the next scenario it's like okay now you can spend it <laughs> it's like well why oh, yeah anyways it's just it's level edging basically yeah <laughs> you can look at it but you can't touch it <laughs> all right uh and then we have a voicemail from ewan uh hello my name is ewan from norwich in the uk um I was just starting to ask uh, what people's physical Arkham setup was. Uh, I've got a tiny coffee table in the corner of my office, and EdgeDS has been a bit of a problem for me. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> trying to <laughs> get solo play, uh, not two-handed, just just the one investigator onto that table has been a bit of a problem, uh, especially with some of the latest scenarios. So uh, I was wondering... It sounds like you guys leave your uh, scenario set up for days at a time, weeks at a time. I have no idea. Uh, I picked up the final scenario of Edge of the Earth two weeks after uh, leaving it halfway finished. So uh, it would move my fin deck. So I'd be curious to hear what you guys do um, and how you guys make it work. Cool. Uh, your uh, message was that was very cute. So thank you very much. Bye. Awesome. Thanks, Ewan. Yes, thanks, Ewan. I, I want to say first, uh, weeks at a time is barely a joke. I know I know he said that <laughs> yeah. as like hyperbole, but, <laughs> yeah. but that's a real thing. And I, I think that's the first thing I would throw out there is that uh, it was a game changer to have dedicated game space that you can leave mm-hmm. if you need to. Yeah. Do you guys do you guys all also have that, or is anyone still like you have to finish the game and pick it up in the same session? Um, I I have I have game space, but if I ever have guests sleeping over or like it, it can temporarily need to be taken down, so I have to be careful right, when right. I do it or whatever. I mean, yeah, like if we're pulling out the guest towels, of course all the games have to come down. Yeah, I I agree though. It's a it's a game changer. Um... And I say that it, it's more in theory for me because I just moved <laughs> to a, a new house. But, uh, Sean, you can confirm this. I've been saying one of the things yeah, I'm, you... I'm most excited about is that in my new area, I have a space where I have a, let's call it a mid-sized table for games. And mm-hmm. so I can leave my Arkham set up there because that was always a, a hurdle of I'd play it and I'd had to haul everything out then mm-hmm. hopefully it would fit on the part of the table that was open and then I'd have to put it away. And now it's just, oh, hey, I'm done. I'll either get set up or it's quick setup next time. Yeah. Your attic is like one of the most bitchingest uh, bachelor pads I've ever known a married man to own. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm fortunate enough that I have a dedicated like board game table and it's in my office in the house so 
that's like my dedicated space i can just leave whatever on there um for yes weeks at a time <laughs> especially important <laughs> having young kids like in, in an area that yes. i can kind of wall off and and keep safe is very important yeah. uh, but in the past i have been in the the same situation that you is mentioning where i was playing on very tiny tables so one problem was the space and I would just have to figure out ways of compressing space by putting like certain cards overlapping with each other or figuring mm-hmm. out like smaller surfaces that I could put certain cards like temporarily. I don't know, just like a lot of tricks like that. And since I wasn't able to to leave stuff up during those days, I would do things like take pic- pictures of my game state if I had to <laughs> if I had to pick it up and then like, refer to that when i'm setting it back up if i got like interrupted or whatever so it's definitely a pain I feel targeted yeah but i i know not <laughs> everyone has the space or ability to have that dedicated game space so i don't know it's tough yeah you just just figuring out different strategies to make the most of it i guess um but yeah and it, while I'm always going to throw a pitch out there for, hey, feel free to ask in Discord. Other people might have better ideas even than, than we do. I mean, here, here's what we have to work with. Oh, almost uh, definitely. Yeah. Do. I'm also yeah. going to throw a shout out to the um, Arkham Reddit because I am 90% certain that I've seen posts come through positing, hey, how can I play Arkham on an airplane um, tray table? <laughs> Things like that. Uh <laughs> So Just eight games of Essex County Express. <laughs> yeah. My God, how yeah. possibly? So there's there's good resources out there. Uh, if our answer of uh, have a dedicated dedicated gaming table or take pictures is not as helpful as we hope it is, <laughs> I would also like say to um, I know he said he's from the. Uh, it's Ewan, yeah, from the UK. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a, a mm-hmm. friend recently come over to uh, Canada uh, from Denmark, and she's doing like an eight-month thing at the university here, and I helped her find an apartment, like, because she wasn't, she needed to find one before she arrived. Um, and I, I, I found one, but it was interesting to see, like, her reaction to it, because for me, I was like, oh yeah, this apartment's okay. It's a bit small, but I mean, she's a single person. Like, it's not crazy. And then she got here and she's like, this place is huge. <laughs> Context <laughs> matters. <laughs> it, it's just that North American uh, space versus mm-hmm. European mm-hmm. space. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we have space philia over here. Just, just noting that as something that uh, Ewan can keep in mind. Like, as we a spouse like oh yeah i have this table here in my second guest room <laughs> like right. we, I, yeah. I am also realizing that i also understand that people who live not in north america may yeah. also suffer from suffer god anyways <laughs> suffer uh, from european housing yes. yeah like just yes they, yes they might <laughs> it's just a you know i mean they have socialized health care and all social services so there you go it's the trade-off well, I mean, just like straight up, Europe doesn't have that much space left. So yeah. it, that's that's just, that's a reality. Been around for a while. Also, so. they don't like tear down and rebuild their shit every other year like we do in America. Mm-hmm. They have buildings older than our our countries are. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. History, some might call it. Yeah. <laughs> some may. <laughs> Possibly. Um, okay, so I, I kind of want to expand on this, like, what is what are the logistics of how you play? So, basically, since the, uh, the, the revised core and the new big boxes have come out, my Arkham kind of exists in a state of, I have, <laughs> okay, so, I'm in a very similar boat to both Psychopath and Big Kahuna in chat here. I, I have a small family, it's just me, my wife, and my 15-year-old daughter, who never cares about the dining room table Mm -hmm. uh so like my kitchen table is basically just my gaming space i leave a third of it open so that someone can sit and work at it during the day if they need to because both me and my wife work from home but uh i also have a little like roll along shelf desk that Mm -hmm. has most of my arkham stuff in it and i most of the time that just sits by the table but if I need to, I can wheel it somewhere else. Um, so yeah, like most of my like my current campaign exists 
uh, if it's edge, it exists in its own box because it has its own box. But if it's not edge, then I've like moved all the encounter cards and the decks I'm playing into my revised core storage, and oh. I just pull from there. Uh, and then as well, I've I still am rocking. I don't know if anyone else is still rocking the Hobby Lobby case. Yeah, two never of them. had it in the first place. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> yep, two of them. It's the only thing I have or will buy at Hobby Lobby. For... Yeah. Ever. Uh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> we don't we don't have Hobby Lobby in Canada and I'm always like there's one near FFG and I'm always like mm -hmm. how can I get this back on the plane? <laughs> and I'm just I've never figured it, it out. As its own empty carry-on. Yeah. Yeah. Just make it look right. like a, a a suitcase like I made it mine look like. I decked yeah, mine out right. decked mine out with stickers so it looks like a vintage suitcase. <laughs> I wonder if I so I've got on. so so then I've got the 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 Hobby Lobby case contains all of my level zero cards, uh, myriad cards, bonded cards, and weakness cards. Well, I suppose myriad cards are all mostly level zero, but um, and then and then I have one of the big ugly BCW, I think three or four lane boxes mm. that have all of my leveled up cards. And those just sit by the table, too. So that's how my Arkham uh, collection exists, uh, in, in a constant state of not being fully sorted. <laughs> I have uh, two two of the five-lane BCW boxes. And then I did a similar thing to you, Sean, where whatever I'm playing at that time, um, I use... I either have uh, the Return To box, as yes. like where I keep mm -hmm. the campaign stuff, um, mm -hmm. or... And then in addition to that, I have like these little plastic deck holders that can hold two decks at the same time. Like they're like, mm -hmm. what's that? Du Ultra dual Pro? deck holders. Yeah, dual deck holders. Um, mm -hmm. For And I have like my deck and then my upgrades or whatever. Or if it's more an eye playing, it's two decks. Uh, or if it's something without a return to that I use the revised core as the as the deck or the, the box holder for that campaign while I'm playing through it. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, the other way I set up is I open up TTS. And then I... <laughs> I was actually surprised you had a legitimate answer. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was going to be your thing. I mean, you double click the icon. <laughs> I, I have an organization. The amount I use it is, is the question, <laughs> but yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I have two cases for the player cards. Uh, I have one that I had custom made on Etsy, which is kind of an expensive solution, but it's a bigger box and it has uh, got the Mythos Busters logo on it. Um, it's amazing. So that holds most oh, of yeah, the... Oh, yeah, that's right. I remember you posted pictures of that. That thing's pretty. Yeah, I'll have to see if I can find the pictures to post in chat. Um, and then... It's not quite big enough to hold everything, though, so my neutrals and the dual class cards are in my old Hobby Lobby case. Um, and then, similar to, to you guys, the campaigns are each in their own separate box. The standalones are in my revised core box. So that's kind of how everything is set up. And, uh, yeah, the, the two player card boxes just sit on my game table pretty much at all times, because... Uh, that's the game I play most often and constantly like building and tearing down decks. So I used to have it where it was like on a separate shelf or place, but it's annoying because I use it that often to just keep moving it around. So it just basically lives there. <laughs> so I can, so I can always access it or add more cards to it. So yeah, that's, that's kind of how I do. And then, um, oftentimes I will, like, I think I mentioned this on the cast before, but set up a game the night before because sometimes by the time mm -hmm. I'm done tearing and building <laughs> decks and setting up a scenario, I'm like, either I'm too tired or there's not enough time in the night or I just don't feel like playing. So now I just kind of segment it. Okay, set it up. And then the next night or whenever I play, it's nice to just sit down and play and be ready to go. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh my god, dude, that's that is such a thing. Like I will <laughs> like get to the end of the day and everything's done and the, everyone else is in bed. And I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, hey, it's Arkham time. And it takes me so long to like pull out the decks, upgrade from experience from last time, make sure that the chaos bag like cause you know, I shuffle between campaigns endlessly. So every time I sit down I have to readjust everything. Which is maybe part of my own problem that I should examine. Uh, but by the time I actually get all that done, so many times I'm like, well, 
I guess I'll start this game tomorrow with my coffee before I log in for work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yep. Which, you know, there are worse problems to have, but... Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, Ewan, for uh, for calling in, and thanks, Big Kahuna. We always appreciate his, uh, uh, hearing from you guys. Wow, sorry, I'm, I'm dividing my attention. As I mentioned... If you have a comment, a question, a discussion topic you'd like to drop us, 203-493-6984. We'd love to hear from you guys. Uh-huh. Scott. <gasps> Rules. And this one I'm super excited about. You have so much text in here. I am so excited. Go. Okay. So uh, the reason this is a lot of text is because um, this is a question and then an answer email uh, that someone sent into ffg and they got a reply um but we're going to discuss the the impact of it so uh, basically the person asked started asking uh, about committing daredevil to another investigator's skill test so i'm just going to quickly go over daredevil because this is important so after you commit it's a rogue skill by the way uh Level 0, there's also a level 2 one, but this one has a wild. After you commit Daredevil to a skill test, discard cards from the top of your deck until you discard a skill card, a rogue skill card, you can commit to this test. Commit it. Shuffle each weakness that was discarded by this book back into your deck. So, knee-jerk reaction, and I think we thought this too, like, this is correcting me uh, as well, is... um, after you commit this to a test, you can discard cards on top of your deck until you find a rogue skill card that you, you can commit to this test. But you've already committed Daredevil, right? And so if you're committing it to someone else across the table, you can't commit, or at least we thought you could not commit a, another rogue skill, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the person goes to question, um, basically, once they commit, will the effect successfully and completely resolve committing a second card to the skill test. Because there's no rule saying that you cannot commit more than one, and the step two rule allows uh, you to commit is permissive for that step, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't restrict you. Some people are thinking that this would work. Uh, And this person goes on to say, this has always seemed fine for Daredevil, but when I look at other cards like Astronomical Atlas and Practice Makes Perfect, which are uh, considerably more powerful effects, he said, "I, I have doubts that they're meant to do that. So basically... Am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to to get around the limit one uh, commitment to other people's tests for a skill card? So the answer comes back, and it's MJ encourages you to think of the rule stating you can commit one card to another player's test as a permitted amount, but not a hard limit. Card effects can enable you to commit more than one card to another person's skill test. So as a permitted amount, but not a hard limit is like the gameriest gamer yep. gamer line, <laughs> but I, I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. So the big thing to me is card effects can enable you to commit more than one card to another player's skill test. So with Daredevil, you can commit it and the card searches, the card it searches for, if it can commit to another investigator skill test, it can. Practice mm-hmm. makes perfect. You could commit one to them, like a, a, a normal one. And then play pa- Practice Makes Perfect twice if you wanted to and commit a total of three cards. And four cards if you mandy and dig uh, uh, an extra target out, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so on Astronomical Atlas, it has a the Zabby Boy, two Zabby mm-hmm. Boys. So one is Exhaust It. Look at the top card of your deck. If it's not a weekend weakness, attach it to Astronomical Atlas. The other Zabby Boy is Commit a card attached to Astronomical atlas uh to an eligible skill test if it succeeds add that card to your hand instead of discarding it let once per test so you could uh if you had two atlases out and somehow you're also playing practice makes perfect and maybe daredevil is there anyone who... hmm. jim can do it <laughs> yeah you could essentially commit like five cards to someone else's test i was gonna say mm. lola but she can only take <laughs> all of the cards not do all of those things dexter can do it right uh, can he take Practice Makes Perfect? Oh, you're talking about Practice Versatile, Makes Perfect? he can. Yeah, uh, and he, Daredevil. Oh, you're the full suite? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. With Atlas. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's like Jim only. I think so, because of the Dunwich Splash. So anyways, mm-hmm. I absolutely love this. The fact that, um, especially like, you know, Practice Makes Perfect, often panned, not a very good card, really needed the boost, you know? <laughs> it, uh... <laughs> It was, it was it was having a rough time. 
Yeah. <laughs> I think this makes Astronomical Atlas a lot way more Way better. Though. Yeah. Way, way better. Daredevil, I think... I mean, I think it was it's it's perfectly fine the way it is. This maybe gives it a bit a bit of a bump, but if you're playing Daredevil, you're playing it for yourself anyways, and probably in I, Winnie. I do I do really love the idea of Daredevil going and finding a copycat, and then you using copycat <laughs> to grab a skill from the person's discard pile that you're committing to to begin with. Oh, if only copycat was level zero, and then Jim oh, could commit even more. <laughs> if only. Yeah. I, I think the tough part of Daredevil is because a lot of rogue skills are like, uh, because of the nature of the class, selfishly focused, like committing yes. only to your test. So you, yeah, couldn't, confirmed. you couldn't commit those ones. So yeah, you might not find a match, but maybe you will. I do appreciate the expansion of the multiplayer ability to commit to other players' tests, like in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I find that's that's one of the coolest things about multiplayer is to like look across the table and be like, "Yo, can I get a help?" Yeah, and sometimes people have a help, and it's great, especially high impact ones like you know a deduction or a vicious blow mm-hmm. or something like you know it's not just icons like there's something tricksy going on. Yeah, I'm I'm a fan of that. Anyways, I thought that was awesome because I always thought that you couldn't play practice makes perfect and also commit one someone else's test but now you can sure so yeah it it, it makes sense to me it kind of reminds me of like framework effects that came up in lord of the rings a few times like you get the one commit like free as part of the 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 framework of the game and these Mm -hmm. card effects just let you add to that essentially so yeah yeah you can you can manually commit one card per test Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but these ones allow you. Which also, this just—I feel like this also completely makes sense. Like it feels right, but the old way mm-hmm. also felt right. But this way also mm-hmm. feels right. Like I'm totally like, this doesn't. It, it's totally fine by me. So worth noting. It seems like they have someone else answering questions. By the way, because it speaks of MJ in the the third person. Hmm. MJ so, encourages you. <laughs> yes, MJ encourages you to think of the rules, stating you can commit only one card to a player's test as permitted amount, not a hard limit. Wholesome MJ is best MJ. <laughs> yeah. just, just encouraging everyone to to yeah. commit cards. We should have a T-shirt. MJ encourages you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. There's rules. <gasps> Lovely. Fantastic. All right, boys. I want to have a, a hard-hitting, Oof. super rigorous, very casual, laid-back uh, discussion <laughs> about like the general state of the game. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I know I took you on a ride well, there. now I'm all confused. <laughs> <laughs> How am I supposed to feel? So I think the, the most ripe discussion to have is kind of the state of the player card pool, right? Mm. Uh, because definitely we hit that point. I want to say it was around Dream Eaters where, I don't know, I've followed the, the life of a few living card games uh, that expand in their own way, and, and it's kind of in, like, these discrete movements that, that the player card pool gets expanded. Uh-huh. And there's always a certain tipping point where you're like, holy cow, after those most recent releases deck space is just huge Mm -hmm. i personally would put that at around dream eaters might have happened a little bit earlier than that if you're really creative but where we're at now after edge dropped and all of those dual dual or sorry multi-class cards Mm -hmm. like there are some with three now uh dropped like deck building space is so wide I see shit on Arkham DB that I never would have thought of, and uh, uh, I love that part of a life of a of an LCG personally. Yeah, I I always I, so I've done the same thing as you, Sean. Like where I've followed a lot of LCGs, and some of them competitive, some of them cooperative. Mm-hmm. And I always feel like the first year of an LCG sucks. Like it's it just, rough. I'm just I'm gonna say it. Like I mean, you know, I look Everyone's... back fondly, but. Mm-hmm. All the decks are the same. Everyone's trying mm-hmm. to like get blood from a stone. As There's far always as... a power deck or like two power decks that just kind of rule the meta, and yeah, you know, the impact to the card pool isn't big enough upon a new release to really shake it up for a while. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, if you look back, flavor. if you look back into like imagine Dunwich when we had 
all of Dunwich, okay? Core and Dunwich. I would argue that there was a correct build for each investigator oh, out. Oh, correct like, in specific I, words, Scott. I know. That's yeah. I'm I'm going to jump in. Yeah. That is part of the reason I love where the card pool's at as mm-hmm. someone on the more casual side because yeah. it can feel like there is a correct version and that makes it a little tough to dive more into the community if mm-hmm. you just want to ask about deck building whereas mm-hmm. now it doesn't feel like that. Yeah. And I think I mean, it's been in it ebbs and flows, but I think the community in general has been very good at if you if you go to you know like a forum or on our Discord or whatever, and you're going to the like the deck building area, and you're like, hey, I'm trying to build this type of deck, you know, like I'm tr- I'm using Jenny as a frame to build this type of deck or whatever. Someone might go like, oh, well, here's a really good Jenny deck, and you can go, no, I'm not really looking for like you know super optimized. I'm looking for fun, and everyone's like, mm-hmm. okay, have you tried this, right? Like, and they just start. <laughs> throwing stuff at a wall and seeing what sticks mm-hmm. and i mean maybe, maybe correct is a strong word but i think an <laughs> optimized like an optimum build there you for go each one. okay that has that has far less gatekeeping <laughs> okay yeah 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 <laughs> yeah. Co- yeah correct is probably the wrong word but i mean like competitive <laughs> card games would totally use that but right right my intent was not to be gatekeeping no but I, th- I think that's actually a good call out because even optimized you're not intending to be gatekeeping with it but it can be mm-hmm. I mean, it can be intimidating, yes. right? And so almost unintentional gatekeeping there. But mm-hmm. I also want to very much echo what you, you've said, Scott. The community is very welcoming overall in general. And then I think the state of the card pool right now really helps that too, especially for people who are just starting to dip their toe in. Yeah, because I would argue now, I don't know if there is one optimized, like, one peak optimized deck for any investigator. Be- oh, definitely not. Because the card, like it's, I mean, uh, Dubs is amazing. <laughs> I, I will say it's, it is a fantastic <laughs> deck. But how did I know this was going to be a segue into you yeah. talking about somewhere? Get yeah. off my somewhere. bingo card. I, I mean, I didn't mention it last episode, so now. I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it just. I, I love this point now that, it it it's at. It feels like, and I, sorry, Sean, it feels like magic where magic has such a depth of cards because it goes back so long. We're at the point now and yeah, I'd, I'd agree. Probably dream eaters is where it's like, wow. Like I, there's so many options, so many investigators, so many different builds and there's all these archetypes as well. Like you can build in rogue, let's say, you know, smog builds for many investigators just stuff like that. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I think you're right. At Dream Eaters, that's what it hit. And now it's just unbelievable. And I love it. Yeah, I think a good marker for me is... I, can, I don't know exactly at what point this game hit this um, level. But this happened with Lord of the Rings 2. Is where the game... The card pool reached a point where there were more deck ideas around than I had time to try. Um, and we're definitely at that point now. Mm. Like, there's so many deck ideas where I'm like, okay, I, I still need to try that. I mean, part of it is I just don't have as much time as I used to, but it's still yeah. just like in the early days of the game, since there weren't as many investigators and cards, like, I felt like I had tried or had a good handle on most of the deck types that were out there. And now that seems kind of impossible, <laughs> like, and I just have to be okay with that. But I, I think ultimately it's a good thing that I know instead of getting tired of the game and, and building decks, I know there's always something else out there that I can try. Um, and I think that's a good thing. And and also just since we're talking about state of the game, um, just just worth mentioning that I think... Like, as we're talking about the state of the game, I was watching the uh, little short in-flight report thingy the other day, and the head of the studio of FFG was mentioning that uh, Arkham Horror LCG is pretty much his favorite game that they they make, which is a good sign. And also just reiterating, after all these years, that it's still like a top seller for them and pretty much their most successful game, or at least one of the most successful which generally LCGs tend to just be like a straight line down from release <laughs> um, mm-hmm. in popularity and sales. It doesn't seem to be the case with for Arkham. So um, strap in, everyone, because I think we're going to be making these podcasts for a long time. 
<laughs> yeah. I don't think this game's going to go away anytime soon. Like, I think we, knock well, on wood, we might beat the Lord of the Rings 10 year mark eventually. God, did that last a decade? It did. Yeah, Oof. 10 year. I think it's oh, their long, longest ever LCG. Hell yeah. We'll beat it. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah. <laughs> we'll beat it. Yeah. I played their shortest one. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, Conquest. Oh, no. Oh, oh no. Too real. Too yeah. real. <laughs> Although, you know, Legend of the Five Rings was also super short. That was that pretty one was like, short, yeah. That was flash in the pan. I don't know which one's shorter, but... Um, yeah. yeah, that one surprised me, because they were setting that up to be, like, their new competitive game. Yeah, they bought mm-hmm. the whole license outright, and yeah... And yeah. then I stopped paying attention, like, right when they released the co-op expansion for that. I slept on it, never bought it, never even realized. Uh, and now, like, I was looking at my L5R cards, and I was like, man, I'd love to be able to just kind of, like, plunk around with these, even if I don't play a real game. Mm-hmm. Dude, you, you cannot find that co-op expansion. It goes for, like, $300 That's what on I heard. eBay. <sighs> I feel like if the game like, would have lasted, they would have explored that space more. But unfortunately, it was too late at that point, I think. I don't understand why some of the most enticing FFG product products are the ones that they were like, oh, we'll print five. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, yeah. And, and Ian, to, to talk about the length of like Arkham and the, the possibility of it going forward, um, I have it on, on good good knowledge that they just recently hired... Uh, another developer for the game. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, be interesting to see what that person puts out. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, not sure. Not sure. I trust him with the game. Not sure how well he's experienced in in Arkham. But uh, yeah, we've uh, we've heard some rumblings of uh, the next campaign being the shotgun campaign, <laughs> mm, yeah. uh, the shotgun and dinosaurs campaign. <laughs> Every single scenario starts off in a community theater. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, look, all of these things are things I would actually play, so Nick, get on it. Yeah, it's quite a, <laughs> quite a noxious attitude, but... Uh... Oh, I see what you did there. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't see Arkham ending anytime soon. <laughs> I mean, if it does, then that's where we get to mobilize the community with the write-in petition. We have the infrastructure. <laughs> yeah. We have the technology. Uh, so as you guys kind of look across the, the player card pool and like what you guys tend to build and play, do you find that you have the problem more of, well, no, we all, we all have the problem of like too many ideas, not enough campaigns. Mm -hmm. I guess my specific question is, does anyone else have the problem that I have where, uh, some deck ideas definitely stand head and shoulders above others and when you get like two scenarios into a campaign with a deck that isn't quite firing like you thought it was gonna you become sad uh that that happens to me more regularly than i i wish it did and it's my own fault i'm not blaming the game but i've changed my mentality on it now where um if I have a deck idea and I start going through a campaign and it ends up being not great, I just absolutely dumpster it and I don't care. Mm. And also sometimes, and this is like super breaking the rules and I don't even care because I have so many deck ideas that I want to play, mm-hmm. is I'm two scenarios in, I've earned 13 XP and I'm like, this deck sucks. I'm going to grab this other deck I want to play, upgrade to 13 XP, continue yep. the campaign. Like I just hundred percent because I'm like I don't care like it, it just I realize that's not the rules but I it's a way I enjoy it and there's a lot of campaigns I play full through legally or whatever you want to call that but there's if I'm just trying ideas I'm just gonna mm-hmm. try ideas so I did exactly that in in our edge campaign with Justin and Brian because like I I mentioned on the last uh, t- two episodes ago actually uh, I had a min deck where I tried to incorporate too many ideas Mm. and uh, the deck itself got a little muddled and just kind of like sputtered. I was supposed to be dedicated Kluver, and I think I'm pretty sure Winnie outpaced me in clues. (laughs) Uh, So, so I felt like I had to step my game up and so yeah, that next time I just brought like a standard uh, min scavenging deck with, with some of the new stuff that I wanted to try out and uh, no regrets. It worked a lot better this time. It was quite fun to watch it fire. 
I, like, still the only problem I have with fucking scavenging decks is, like, until you find scavenging, it, it can be a little rough because I'm doing, like, scavenging and ice, ice picks and fingerprint kits and, like, active desperation and kind of, like, doing all those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, but until you find scavenging, you're just looking at it, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. I found, too, that I have to seriously protect myself against doing making decks where I'm trying to do too many things. Like I have to be like, Scott, mm-hmm. just focus on the idea of what you're doing. Don't throw in four different combos. You're looking no, but to Scott, be... w- but wouldn't this be cool? I know it would be cool. But, but, Sean. but wouldn't this be cool though? <laughs> well, the thing is if I do that, I won't get to do the thing <laughs> I was making the initial deck for, right? Like, but did you include 30 good cards? <laughs> well, sometimes I don't, right? Like that's the thing. Like, I'm pretty sure that, you know, anti-aircraft gun skids doesn't have 30 good cards. But, like, there's, like, 20 good cards. He's got two. Yeah. (laughs) And they're the ornate bows. Two very important cards. Well, and, uh, (laughs) what's it called? Bandolier. That's a very important card for that deck. Mm Mm-hmm. And see, I run into a different problem than you do, Sean. Um, And it's purely because I I play less. Uh, For me, the, the deck building, and this is an air quotes, problem is I have an idea, but I'm not always 100% on what cards will actually accomplish that because mm. it, it's, a good, it's a good problem to have. The card pool has gotten so large that I don't even always remember everything that's in it. So mm-hmm. it's, it can make the deck building tough on the one hand, but it does also then add a little more of that exploration element to it where it's not just, oh, hey, there's this type of deck out there and then be like, oh, that's neat. I'd like to try it then more and more I get to be like, ooh, this card, I forgot it exists or didn't know, and at a little more granular level get to do that. So with that space, do you ever find yourself like halfway in and or, or like a couple games in and being like, oh, I forgot this card exists. I wish I had included it, that sort of thing? A little bit. Uh, it's usually... You're going to hear me talk about Keyforge. Sorry. <laughs> it's it's all... it's usually comes up if it's like i'm playing a bad keyforge deck where it's wow this is technically a deck i can play but boy even the something that's average is just smashing it except here mm-hmm. instead of another deck it's the scenario mm-hmm. so it, there there i will and then i usually then go to arkham db and you know i'll look around try and find similar stuff and be like oh yep that was the piece or three that i forgot to include mm-hmm. but it's it's a neat thing i never feel bad that i don't know because I just don't know, and that's how you learn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think potentially one of the things that makes that more challenging is the the new release model. Um, yeah, we've talked about it before, the pros and cons. But it used to be like, let's say you're building a deck, a new pack comes out, and there's like a finite number of cards. It's pretty small, and when you're building a deck, like you just have those to think about that are new in the brain. But now it's like you have this huge dump of all these cards. And I often forget some of the cards that came out in Edge of the Earth, for example, because like the ones that really stand out to you, they stand out and you remember. And like certain ones I've tried a bunch of times now, but others kind of fell through the cracks because it's, it's it's a big pool of cards to add all at once. So I think that's the challenge I'm running into more recently is just. Uh, fi- finding ways to like go back through that list and and remember what's there um, is a little bit tricky, especially with a, a short amount of time. And, and the other challenge for me in this regard is, as the options have increased, in some ways of and beca- also because of time pressure, like I only have a l- so so much time to play Arkham, I've strangely found myself like going into my familiar channels more and more, like. I, I talk mm-hmm. often about my Rogue of 80 investigators, um, as everyone knows. But earlier in the game's life, because there was such a smaller pool of stuff, I dipped my toes into like all kinds of classes and builds. And I still do that to a certain extent, but because there's so many rogues now and so many of 80 types, like I spend a lot of time... Like I think this prompted this when I was looking through my recent decks and how many of them were green. And that may be like, <laughs> duh, you like rogues, but it didn't used to be that way as much. And so, like, I feel like I need to find more ways with this bigger card pool to push myself um, to try 
other stuff. No, I'm just imagining Ian looking at all these other cards and being like, this is fine, but why isn't it nimble? <laughs> <laughs> Man, why isn't every card nimble? <laughs> I kind of love nimble. Mm-hmm. Oh, Ian, I have I have the same issue that you do uh, with the new with the new release cycle. As someone who I, I think kind of has a at least reaching at a an encyclopedic knowledge of the player cards, I realized that a big part of my ability to maintain that was the gradual uh, release of them. Mm-hmm. Because when Edge dropped, like there are still some cards I couldn't really tell you what they do from memory. Uh, which you know, six we are what like fully 10 months after release at this point uh-huh. Some, something like that something like that. like that's that's obscene for me i would have everything memorized in you know the the cycles before because it just came out so much more regularly um but i, I would also say that and and maybe this is getting a little too philosophical a little too irl but when things get busy in real life and like maybe your mental capacity isn't is is being taxed a little bit more. I just generally find it harder to step out of my comfort zone in all aspects of life, including <laughs> sure. which, in, including which cards I I look at uh, uh, for Arkham Horror, the card game. Find the warm embrace of my agility and <laughs> wallow. Yeah, you know, right? Like, yeah, I I think everyone's got like, your like comfort TV shows. I have comfort decks. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know that people have done studies about like uh, anxiety and the comfort of like watching familiar TV shows and in, in some ways <laughs> instead of watching new stuff. In some ways, it's similar. Um, Absolutely. Al- also, I think the campaign structure of this game, because I was, as I often do, comparing to my Lord of the Rings experience. I think at a similar Freak. point in Lord of the Rings, I was still trying like probably more decks than I do in Arkham. And I was like wondering why that was. I'm like, well, duh, it's the campaign structure. Campaign. Like, you're yep. committing each. <laughs> you're playing fewer decks than you do in a game like Lord of the Rings because you're taking them through, um, like eight scenarios at least. Whereas with Lord of the Rings, like, because it's just one scenario by one scenario, like you're constantly like, okay, I'll build this deck for this quest and this for this one. Um, so. So I feel like if you really want to like push yourself and try new cards, probably like standalone is the place to go often. Like that's that's what I often do when I want to try out these cards. Like I don't want to waste time getting the XP to upgrade. I'm just gonna build a standalone deck and try it against a scenario, and mm-hmm. that's when you can really try out some funky stuff. I think that's actually a really good segue. We've talked about it a few times at at various points of the the game's life. Um, standalone is, you know, from the get go, a design of, of one way you could play the game. Um, I personally have found a, a pretty strong ebb and flow of when I actually myself decide to play standalone. And it's right now at an ebb. Ebb is when it becomes less, right? Yes. Ebbing. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Ebb of the earth. Um, <laughs> Yeah, like because right now I, I find myself not playing too much standalone because, you know, as I've mentioned, I've only played Edge like three times at this point, which is an all time low for how long that campaign has been out. Do you guys find yourself playing X amount of, of standalone nowadays? Uh, I find I play less standalones. Why is it for you? I think I prefer to build campaign decks. Sure. I think. And so when someone's like, when I, it's, when I have an idea for a deck, I kind of like to think of it at level zero and like build up to what I'm thinking and like all I'm most familiar with level zero cards because I play them the most because that's what you access the most in the game. Right. And so Mm -hmm. a lot of my ideas come from that or it comes from a single card where I'm like, how can I get to that card as quickly as possible and build my level zero deck to use that as quickly as possible? Like after the first scenario, buy it and then my deck sings or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. Standalone, I don't like the amount of weaknesses in my deck quite honestly yeah there's that <laughs> you know it just and sometimes those weaknesses just wreck and then, like i mean i always check what my weaknesses are and if there's one that just absolutely wrecks the deck i'm like okay cool you win i'm gonna redraw mm-hmm. that uh just because i'm all there for fun and yeah. you, you want a good game and yeah. like i'm sorry if you want to be like a stricty mcstrictorson you go ahead but yeah 
If if I draw uh, amnesia in Winnie, yeah, I'm I'm mulliganing that. Yep, absolutely. I watch I watched. <laughs> So I played through Innsmouth with uh, a friend of the show, Kyle, uh, from from Optimal Play and from our board. Hmm. Uh, and he kept Amnesia in Winnie and played through that entire campaign with it. And I was oh. just like, God damn, what a trooper. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> Soldier. That's too. not me. <laughs> it's like yeah, getting, I... uh, what's it, doomed in Patrice? Yeah. Oof. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Paranoia on like a big money invest build. That's the worst. Um, yeah, I I actually prefer standalone deck building to campaign deck building for the reasons I mentioned. Like, I feel like it gives me the most scope to really try out weird builds. But the vast majority of my actual play is campaigns just because I really dig. I mean, that's one of the reasons I love Arkham. Just the the story you can tell through playing through a campaign. So... I always want to play more standalone, but again, it's just a function of time. Um, I find myself <clears throat> playing a lot of standalone when it's we're getting close to um, like some type of in-person event, like doing yeah. Iron Man or getting together like Arkham Knights in the past, because I'm usually trying to try out different standalone builds or, or figuring out whether like a leveled up version of a deck can, can function without playing through a whole campaign, so... That's usually when I'm. Well, yeah, you want to show up at the events and like impress the boys, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I feel like my most creative decks have been built like for standalone versus campaign. Mm. Interesting. I would agree with that. That my most creative and off the wall decks are definitely standalone decks, Mm -hmm. because if it if it fails to fire, (laughs) it only wrecked one game. Yep. You know, yeah, there, there's yeah. that exactly. <laughs> See, I was gonna go like, well, when you remove the whole like needing to build into it, then it just makes it more simplistic. But yes, absolutely, what you said is the better answer. Yeah, <laughs> like so many of my decks, like I said, I get two uh, two scenarios into a campaign, and I'm like, mm, I don't like this as much as I thought I would. Mm-hmm. And that's that's way better if you've tested it ahead of time. And like straight up, like Ian, I'll I'll point at your uh, uh, Jenny Black Clock uh, Sophist build. Mm. There are some decks that just like the thought of getting to them in a campaign is a little bit painful. Hmm. I, yeah, for sure. Ian, I'm gonna chat more about that deck later because it relates to technical <laughs> time. But that deck is absolutely insanely fun. And Sean, I agree. I think that deck would be nigh impossible to play through a campaign and get to the the <laughs> state like, that the f- is. <laughs> what the fuck are you going to do with the sophist before you have the clock? <laughs> I, I don't know. Play him for four resources so just so you could? Got yeah. some soak. <laughs> I tried scaling it down. It was painful. I'm sure you could... <sighs> I don't know. You need like, to get the XP though, Ian. You need to somehow win yeah, scenarios and get that, the lose. That's the thing is like for a lot of these creative standalone decks, they rely on so many different pieces and mm-hmm. they're like a sum of their parts. And so if you're trying to operate and pilot them with only some of those <clears throat> parts at once, you're probably mm-hmm. not going to be optimal. You're not going to get the XP you want or need. So it's going to make it hard to get there. So like I think campaign deck building and progression is its own beast and can be its own fun mm-hmm. and challenge because it's really like figuring out how to both build a deck that can win you scenarios early on and then also like how are you gonna progress that to be better. But yeah, I don't just because of that structure, like I feel like I play it safe more with campaign because you have more to lose. Um <laughs> But it's it's not that I don't enjoy it. It's just, it's just a different kind of challenge than standalone deck building. I think. Yeah, even looking at so that d- deck. So, <laughs> Eldritch Sophist, what's he gonna do at level zero? Nothing. With Doctor Ellie Horowitz in there, what can she grab? Nothing. Like, it's, <laughs> like you have Bandolier in there, and you only have two weapons. <laughs> like why? <laughs> but but once. Once it's created, it is a mm-hmm. masterful deck. But scaling that down, I think mm-hmm. this deck would absolutely suck, and it would yep. be nigh unplayable and nigh unwinnable. 
Mm-hmm. But that's also what I love. Like, how would I get anti-aircraft gun skids at level zero? Like, mm-hmm. can't no. even get the bows. Like, that doesn't just even make no. sense. It just, no. It, it, why? Why would I play through a campaign through six scenarios to finally get enough XP to play the deck I wanted to play for two scenarios? I think that actually might be an interesting thought. Like, some of these standalone decks, I want to play them right away, and I don't want to put in the work to build them over six <laughs> games or seven games, so I can play them for one or two games. Why not just play that deck? Yep. So, so do you guys think that, uh, as far as like scenario design and the difficulty of those scenarios, that the logistical bottleneck that is building the the gradual build of a campaign mode deck like keeps the difficulty in check as opposed to the game having to balance around optimized uh you know standalone decks yes i think maybe but because campaign mode is like that's the general way most people play this game right yeah i would i would probably agree with that yeah yeah i Oh, that's a hard question to answer. Yeah, I know. You it's stumped us. There's, <laughs> yeah. there, there's nuance. I, I personally ascribe to that thought that that like campaign is kind of how the game is. It seems to be most balanced. Uh, obviously, the, the standalone scenarios are their own thing. Um, but I don't feel like the the scenarios that we see are built with the idea that, you know, two, three two or three scenarios into a campaign, you could have this optimized, you know, combo-y standalone deck. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that might keep a little bit of the craziness out of, because I'll use Lord of the Rings as an example, because it's the one I know the best. Uh, There there was, there was some like push me, pull you uh, in the meta game Mm -hmm. in that, in that (laughs) game. And I feel like that might be one of the reasons that Arkham has avoided that is because like the really optimized, crazy decks don't play campaign mode as often or if they do at least it takes them a few scenarios to get to that point where they're that powerful Mm -hmm. yeah i think the xp system is a nice like gate system to the card pool in that way because yeah lord of the rings like whenever you're designing a new player card you pretty much have to take the entire card pool into account at all times um so if you design some super powerful new player card uh, I mean, there's nothing stopping everyone from just taking that right away, and it's probably going to overshadow every other card that does something similar if it's if it's designed in that way. And similarly, if you design a you know weaker cards, people are just going to ignore it. But yeah, I, I think the XP system does help guard against that, and I, I think we've seen it too in the campaigns. Like there was a moment <laughs> when TFA came out that some of us were a little bit worried that the game might go down a route of like increasing (laughs) difficulty over time. And I think we've seen by now that that's not the case. Like some things have increased here and there. Yes. But overall I haven't felt like, Oh, they're just really like slamming us. Like we talked um, on the last episode now about like edge of the earth and, and how that one ended and i don't feel like edge of the earth was oh this this is the newest campaign and it's so hard compared to everything before so Mm -hmm. i think everything has been pretty well like kept under control there and and without at least for me personally feeling like the game is also too easy on the other end no i still lose plenty i Mm -hmm. I, I don't know about (laughs) y'all i still lose plenty Mm -hmm. well and i i think too looking at standalones and difficulty and you know that idea that you're saying, Sean, where the standalones are kind of built to be ready for a wacky, crazy deck, and the campaigns are not because they probably won't see that wacky, crazy deck. Mm-hmm. Um, or if they do, it's at least later on. Yeah, which I mean, then it's like you know you're later on in the scenario. Usually they're or the campaign, and they're usually a bit more difficult. Um, mm-hmm. But go back, like the time when we had only like Dunwich and Carcosa most standalones were way more difficult mm-hmm. feeling feeling than we do now but a lot of that is because of the size of the card pool because there's so many like if you want to build a deck around this one specific card or this one specific idea way back in the Carcosa days you'd have 10 or 12 cards that support that and then the rest of your deck was just cards that are generally good 
that you could use to make the scenario go until you get your, you know, 10 to 12 cards or whatever you need to make that idea happen. Whereas now, like, if you have an idea, like, Ian, you, like that Jenny deck, right, where you want, like, these three or four, um, what do you call them, like, relic things, exceptional cards out and make it sing, like, every single card of that 25 card deck is there to make it work all together. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like there's no, it's all killer, no filler. And I think that that has changed how we build decks and has changed how we approach standalones. And for that reason, they can feel easier now than they did back then. Because remember when Rougarou used to be absolutely backbreaking and now it's like Fisher Price, my first standalone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, one other th- th- like wrench I would throw into what you're saying, Scott. I don't disagree with anything you're mm-hmm. saying, but I also want to acknowledge that there has been a little bit, it seems, uh, of a paradigm shift in the way that standalones, like the actual scenarios that are designed to be standalones or side quests, mm-hmm. there's been a paradigm shift there too. Because if you remember... Like, Rougarou through Egypt. Mm-hmm. If you go look at the standalone bags, like, I don't give a shit what the rest is in that encounter deck. Those bags are awful. Yes. And I feel like that is a lot of what makes those scenarios hard. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, if you threw them into a campaign and you just used your campaign bag, it took the teeth off of them quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but even beyond that, if you look at, uh, you know, everything past Egypt... Mm-hmm. Which is what, like Blob, Excelsior, um, uh, War of the Outer Gods, and Machinations. War of the Outer Gods. Their chaos bags, even in like your standalone mode, is basically just a standard bag with you know maybe a little bit, uh, a little bit of of a modification. But yeah, mm-hmm. like Phileon mentions, you don't see that minus five and minus six anymore on like quote unquote standard. Right. So I admit, I honestly don't know how that plays into what we're talking about, but there's been a paradigm shift there as well. I agree with the paradigm shift, but I'm even like looking at stuff like like Curse the Regret and Carnival, like playing them when they came out, mm-hmm. standalone versus playing them now standalone. Like Carnival is hilariously easy to absolutely <laughs> break in half to the point where <laughs> oh, I played yeah. a game that we we did it so quickly. Um, What's the sh- sh- what's the boss monster? The, the squid in Carnival. Um, N- Nadathqua. Yeah, Nadathqua didn't even spawn, and I <laughs> I, I messaged uh, Maxine. I'm like, hey, so we were able to advance the act at this point and get in the boat, but like Shinaqua hasn't shown up yet, and she's like. <laughs> Yeah, we'll pronounce I, that enemy like, like four different ways now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, yeah, uh, Samantha didn't show up. So, uh, all right, there's fine. Yeah. Uh, she's like, yeah, I, I guess like Samantha. She, she just, she, <laughs> Samantha. yeah. Samantha. It's like, <laughs> like the only similarity is it has the same amount of syllables. <laughs> there's a, there's an S sound near the beginning. Um, but like that, that broke the scenario in a way mm-hmm. that you would never have been able to do it. I don't think, um, right, way earlier in the game, despite the despite the the, the paradigm shift that you're talking about with the bag. Mm-hmm. So, well, I almost yeah. feel like part of everything we're talking about is there's a little bit different design philosophy and. Arkham compared to say Lord of the Rings or even Marvel. I know I'm going to make everyone drunk with the drinking game tonight, but uh, just one of those mm-hmm. episodes. Boy, throw but, down the hot takes, Ian. Uh, but <laughs> in Lord of the Rings, and and I'm not pulling this out of the air like the designers of that game would even mention. Like the encounter design was almost uh, meant to to simulate or replicate what a opponent would do to you in a competitive game. Which uh-huh. is like yep. the the scenario is meant to like because player decks are going to scale over time, so that's why we would see a bunch of surge and other effects like that that uh, just like spam cards mm-hmm. out because the idea is like it's supposed to be like an opponent that you're playing that's also scaling their deck up um, and match you, 
but I don't feel like I mean obviously there's there's some element of that but Arkham the way the designers approach this game feels more to me like almost like a a, a DM or GM would in an RPG where it's more mm-hmm. about like setting up environments and challenges for players to struggle with more so than and like, feel awesome in yeah yeah it's like it, it will smash you down sometimes but it's more about like creating almost this like sandbox sandbox and set of challenges okay player how are you gonna handle this more so than like uh simulate like a tournament opponent or something yeah i was just talking about this uh with justin after we wrapped our edge game the or last night uh, like I, I love, and I feel like Arkham kind of fits into this. I love game masters whose prerogative is to make their players feel challenged mm-hmm. and also make them feel awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, and I feel very much like Arkham kind of is that way where, you know, there, there's adjustments here and there. The taboo list exists if you care. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, the, 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 Designers clearly aren't aren't shying away from like letting the players do cool things, and I do feel like the uh, the three action system saves this game's soul in that regard. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the the fact that like unlimited things based on your deck and your draw and your resources in in Lord of the Rings is what made decks get degenerate there. So the fact that you know we, we can game around it a bit, uh, but like the fact that you're bound to three actions a turn in this game, like balances so much you're saying that to a rogue (laughs) (laughs) well and sean to build on your point there and what we talked about it it can still be a game it doesn't feel like i'm doing work at an accounting firm Uh, right right so it it can be a challenge uh at the same time it can be fun and Mm -hmm. it's a nice mix and i think it's in a very very good state for that well, it's just, you know, I, I'm, I've never been, like, a min-max or munchkin player, but it doesn't feel great when, like, the only updates you see rolling out for any given game that you're playing, even if this were, like, a video game or something, where, like, the only updates you see rolling out are nerfs, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, like I, I don't feel that with Arkham. There's, there's adjustments, and, you know, there are some nerfs, but I feel like they're generally healthy nerfs, and there's also, like, lots of buffs. Mm-hmm. Uh, both in new releases and with with what they're doing with the taboo, so yeah, and even on Winchester, like, yeah, Winchester, like, yeah. The action system is is a good point. Like having done some design work for both games, like with Arkham helping design Constellation and working on stuff um, for officially for Lord of the Rings. Like one of the things that's interesting is like coming from that perspective, like Lord of the Rings is very hard to design for, for that reason, because there is no action constraints. Like Mm -hmm. when you design an encounter card, you have to account for everything from like this deck is just like kind of getting allies and cards out at a normal amount to like, I have to be able to counter like a crazy swarm deck. That's like, doing the equivalent of having like 20 actions in Arkham, you know, like spamming out a crazy amount of allies. Whereas, yeah, yeah, obviously you can get a ton of actions in rogue, but in general, like you can kind of like just math out stuff and be like, okay, there's this many actions players are going to have available versus like, this is how much they need to do. And so I think in that ways, it's just a little bit easier to balance and account for. And maybe we're getting too far down the rabbit hole, but I think it's interesting, like comparing those two. Well, and, and I, I think loved, too, I, oh. I love that uh, casual like business card lay down, mic drop. You did they're like, oh, did I mention I design? <laughs> <laughs> like it, it was. I haven't it mentioned was, this it was in very, a while. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was the classiest humble brag I have witnessed in a very long time. It was amazing. I loved it. One thing I think too, Ian, with uh, this is kind of a side tangent, but I kind of I know you mentioned it earlier about like the XP and how it's kind of a great system for this game. Um, Along those lines, comparing it to Lord of the Rings and like saying, you know, if you design a card in Lord of the Rings, you have to know that every single deck possible can take it. Whereas Arkham has this awesome um, setup where if you have two level five cards, like you can design those in a vacuum from the other. 
right? Like a level five rogue card, mm-hmm. a level five uh, mystic card are not ever going to be in the same deck unless there's really weird stuff. I realize now we can like trade assets across the table and stuff. <laughs> sure. But like yeah. that is su- like that is going to take so much work on behalf of the players that like how what else can you do besides throw your hands up at that? Well, um, dude, like even even among like you you gave a good example, but like even among the same class, like a mm-hmm. five a level five mystic card against another level five mystic card, like mm-hmm. not every deck will have that. It is a significant cost to have both of those cards in your deck. So, mm-hmm. uh, uh, yeah, it's you, you have to account for like a a lesser range of deck diversity by far mm-hmm. um, for Arkham. Yeah, and that makes me think of another thing, too. I think the healthy... I mean, I feel like we're just, like, um, putting all these medals on Arkham, but it deserves it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, <laughs> I, I, there are some challenges, like we mentioned earlier, but I think another sign of the healthiness of the state of the game is just the diversity of decks that can be successful or at least have a chance. Like, cause mm-hmm. if you talk about those weird things about like those absurd, like let's, let's swap assets and build up. Like the thing is you don't need to do that to have a chance at this game. Like you can run just like a bog standard, whatever, like a mm-hmm. Preston deck or Ursula deck or whoever. And even without doing any like crazy power moves or optimization, you'll probably have a pretty good chance of, of mm-hmm. being successful even some of the decks that I have played and like partway through a campaign, I'm like, eh, not the best, honestly. I've still been in a lot of the scenarios and had a chance. And I, I appreciate mm-hmm. that. And I'm I'm sure, especially for newer players that come in, like obviously there's a learning curve, but I, I don't know. Maybe new players will feel differently, but I don't think that you have to like really optimize hard, especially with the way, the way the card pool is now to, to at least have a chance in, in scenarios, especially if they take advantage of the starter decks. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. That's just, I love those so much. Yeah. That was a great, a great product idea for sure. Okay. So, so I'm going to completely hijack the conversation and play a little game with you guys. I'm going to go first to leave you guys some, some, a moment to prepare. <laughs> okay. No, I, w- I want you guys to go to wh- whatever aid you need to go to. I'm just in Arkham DB creating a new deck right now so I can see a list of all the current investigators. Yep. <clears throat> Which investigators have you yet to see through a campaign? Uh, because I-, I-, I play a lot, uh, uh, but I do still have a couple blind spots, so I'll kind of go through my list here. Um, in Guardian, the only one that I have not seen through a campaign is Sister Mary. Uh, I, I had, I'm a halfway into an Innsmouth four player campaign with her and everyone's playing with blessed and cursed and she's just part of that, but I have not finished yet. So I'm only like three scenarios in with her cause she's, she's just an oddball mm-hmm. with mystic. I have to, I sadly have to admit that Marie Lambeau is the only investigator I've not seen through an actual campaign. Mm-hmm. I've started a couple with her. I've I've got like three or four different standalone builds that I've played with, but I have not actually played through a whole campaign with Marie. Mm-hmm. Um, neutrals, uh, I've played like five Lola campaigns. Rogues, the only one I haven't played yet is Tony. I don't know why. He seems fun. He seems very straightforward. Haven't played him yet. Into uh, Seekers, I have played with everyone. Seekers, seekers get the check mark from me, as they should. Yep. <laughs> and then with Rogue, or sorry, not Rogue, uh, Survivor, um, I started a a campaign with Bob Jenkins, but did not finish it, so he's on that list. And then uh, the only campaign I've played through with Stella was like uh, Return to the Night of the Zealot, so I barely count it. So I have I have few hours clocked with Zella, Stella, Zella. Zella, their new name. Yeah. <laughs> Zella, yeah, I'm okay. So that's my list. Uh, what, what are your guys' blind spots? Hmm. I was. I had to quickly pull up the list of every investigator because there's a lot. D uh, seven, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. apparently. Jesus. <laughs> um, uh, my memory is not perfect, but I'm 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 pleased that I think I've played with almost everyone except I'm fuzzy. I don't think I've played a complete one with Marie as well. 
Mm. I know I've started some, but I'm pretty sure I have not completed a full campaign with Patrice. Yeah, Patrice is always (laughs) a one that I love the idea, and I just never get around to actually um, trying. Mm. So I need to put that on my list. And the only other Mm -hmm. one can Mm -hmm. think of is, again, I know I've started a campaign. I can't remember if I finished is Tommy. Um, Tommy Tommy has to be one of the investigators I've played the least for sure, even if I've played a full campaign. So those are my three, Marie, Patrice, and Tommy. Okay. That's not bad. Yeah, I'm I'm surprised. I also had to go through the list. Um, (laughs) uh, It doesn't surprise me that any of you would have to go through a list of 57 investigators (laughs) to remember which of them. Uh, Ian, you'll be happy to know I have not yet missed a rogue. I've I've (laughs) campaigned every rogue uh, and every survivor, obviously. Uh, so guardian, Tommy Muldoon, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. just, uh, yeah, I, I have played him a, a few okay. times standalone. Cause I, I think mm-hmm. I feel like I have way more fun. Like he has some cruel, cool builds with standalone stuff, mm. but he is just so milk toast as okay. far as campaign. Like, and that, that was going to be my question. He's on both of your lists. Like what, what's wrong with Tommy boys? Just boring. there's nothing exciting unless you're going like some crazy weird build using becky and stuff otherwise i just okay why why do i throw this one at you okay tommy Mm -hmm. with spirit of humanity Hmm. okay okay and and you lean hard into bless so like you're using spirit of humanity to damage and and cycle tommy's ability okay Okay, I'll so you're like you're like more in control of it rather than like waiting around for enemy attacks to take your stuff out. It's way more. That's my favorite Tommy build was was with Spirit of Humanity. So I'll just throw that out there for you guys. That's that's two XP, so I have to go through at least one scenario without that. Hmm. That's oh my god, what an <laughs> ask! What an ask! <laughs> what if I only get three XP? Okay, so Tommy. I mean, that's... Okay. Uh, Amanda. I've okay. played campaign through. I've played standalone mm-hmm, and really mm-hmm. enjoyed her. Mm-hmm. I just haven't. I don't know. I haven't just haven't had a desire to play campaign with her. I think I'm having enough fun standalone that I'm like I don't really want to build up to this. Sure. From nothing and also like you can do really well with like nine XP. So I feel like I've played enough scenarios with her that I don't need to campaign. But whatever. Uh, and then uh, I believe I. have I believe I've not finished campaign with Jacqueline. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And honestly, it's just another one of those. Why don't I just play a different mystic? Like interesting. Like I, the, the bag fishing thing okay. has not always been like, I have not always been super hot on it because I feel like there's just so many ways you can spend cards to basically just not have a good result anyways. You know what I mean? Like the, mm-hmm. The math sure. on whether it made you pass was something that you would already pass. It's kind of like um, when Scott's like, "I cannot confirm my value acquisition." Yeah. <laughs> that's but that's the case. So so um, uh, what's that podcast called? Uh, Read the signs or whatever. Uh, so oh, wow, mm. <laughs> Frank mm-hmm. when he does his so, draw to the flame when he does his um, his solo <laughs> playthroughs. Uh, he did one where he had blesses and one of the listeners was like, I'm going to record how often you get a bless token and it helps you pass a test that you wouldn't otherwise pass. Ooh, okay. So like and clocking th- useful blesses. Huh? Yeah. And through the oh, entire... Man. I ca- bet that's depressing. <laughs> through the entire campaign, the the percentage, if I remember correctly, was 11% save rate. Where... <laughs> Right, like, but hey, he passed some tests. So you're saying that he would not have otherwise passed. Sure, so but you're how much? Effort... There's a chance. Yeah, <laughs> but how much effort are you putting in to that game mm-hmm. and that deck and using cards mm-hmm. to put all those blesses in there? Why not just replace all those cards with other cards that function and like something like um, instead of using whatever the one with the blesses, the tax spell, um, mm-hmm. the uh, Armageddon. Yeah, like no, there's another one. Anyways. Like, use Arkham's, uh, no, Razor. What's the Razor one? Mm-hmm. 
the Mystic Razor. Spectral Razor? Spectral Razor. Like, instead of some Bless card, put a Spectral Razor in there. Oh, I see. Because you're going to pass that one, right? Like, it's instead of using all those, that Bless tech, like, just, Mm. yeah, so... That's kind but of my Scott, have you with... considered that each bless you draw is like an instant dopamine hit? <laughs> <laughs> Regardless of like, how yeah, effective it is. I did this. <laughs> yeah. I just like that that is where my brain goes, right? And so I look at Jacqueline Five and I'm like, I don't like the bag searching stuff anyways. Like sometimes I find it neat. Like the castration gym mm-hmm. I thought was a funny idea. But that's not even searching. That's just like literally Which removing is... stuff. Right. Which is hilarious because if like if part of your problem with it is like my brain can't track where it's actually giving me a benefit, mm-hmm. like Jim just takes tokens out of the bag. So you never see them. So it's not like your brain can actually track like, oh, I would have pulled this token then, but I didn't because it's out of the bag. No, but, the, but I, like but I think like if you look at like in that case, you've you've altered the composition of the bag itself. And so mm-hmm. the math on like if you're like plus two what's the what's okay. the percentage you're gonna pass is like i don't know 67 percent because of gym but before it was like 53 sure. percent or whatever you know what i mean like that so, gives so, you, so you derive a satisfaction from just like seeing that elder thing token sit on your your stone of of yeah whatever the card is yeah i haven't played that deck in forever or done that type <laughs> of deck before or sorry in mm-hmm. a long time um, right yeah, like that one just feels more concrete rather than like fishing five tokens out and then I have to resolve one of the skulls, but only if this thing and and but mm. I'm doing two of them, but I'm going to replace one of those with this and I'm just like <laughs> I just want to draw a token. <laughs> like can I just Sure. Can I just flip a coin? <laughs> Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. So, and like I <laughs> I get people who love it and I think the me- the the mechanic of it is very interesting and the decks people come up with very interesting not for me at all sure. like i just yeah and i and i'm sure they're good too like i'm probably just out to lunch and well they're probably efficient and do pass tests that they should be failing um but i just that's not my style i mean that is exactly what it comes down to style there are yeah. so many decks i see out there i'm like huh cool i wouldn't enjoy that yeah neat anyways yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. So Jacqueline and Mystics. Yeah. Uh Amanda and Tommy. And Tommy. Okay, That's so it. you've played you've played all of the all of the other ones, huh? Yep. Well done. Yeah, I played Marie. Which you guys have not? Was that it? Yeah, Marie yeah. Marie was on both mine and Ian's list. And I think for me it was just a matter of like how she released. Mm-hmm. Because I kind of like became aware of her when she released as a promo and kind of like paid attention. Never was able to get one myself because I I didn't hop on that particular pre order. Um, and then when she came out, she came out simultaneously with Diana. Guys, like, can you blame me? I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah, I've started a lot of campaigns with Marie. So like, similarly, um, if you added up all the scenarios I've played, it's probably a campaign worth. But. <laughs> <laughs> put together i have a feeling i'll be playing her a lot very soon though once scarlet keys comes out and all yeah the Doom no stuff. doubt <laughs> very soon all the stuff that's coming out for amina mm-hmm. yeah yeah amina amina zidane yeah like mm-hmm. i feel like that's just gonna like turbo boost what yeah, Marie has going on for sure i played marie when she came out like official release because i also didn't get the promo um and <laughs> i just didn't enjoy it so I, I will try her again when all this Doom stuff comes out. But man, like, Baron Samidi is the mm, most there's that. unfun, worst weakness <laughs> in the game for me. Like, I just, I hate it. If she got, like, a parallel thing where she got a different weakness, I would oh. totally play more of her. But I hate 100%. Baron so much. I'm just like, I would rather play anybody else to avoid you. So I I think you ha- you make a very good point. Baron's terrible. You mm-hmm. like you have to plan for him. Like mm-hmm. I feel like most people who play Marie, like one of their very very first upgrades is charisma, just so your weakness doesn't kick out your ally. Right. Uh, there there's a lot to consider with Marie. So that's that's why she's on my list anyway. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Justin, but I know you are are newer to the game first of all, which makes a difference, and also not quite as hardcore. Oh, I mean, it make, 
it makes this part easy though because now i just flip it instead of say who i haven't played i just say who i have <laughs> fair <laughs> because I've, I've actually played a good chunk of the investigators but a, a lot of them in standalone right so if mm-hmm. the question is through a full campaign i think i've got something like 12 on my list here um mm-hmm. but i've got Ashcan, agnes daisy gloria harvey mandy uh jack preston rex silas skids winnie hmm. solid list yeah yep. i mean and that skews seeker rogue with mm-hmm. that's that's about what i would have expected but did i hear ursula have you played ursula i have not oh well i've got a deck for you yeah but i've heard it's not correct <laughs> or optimized <laughs> oh it's correct don't worry <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i uh it's, i mean honestly honestly like now that you have your dedicated gaming space if you're gonna dip into solo at all dubs as much as it pains me to stroke maybe, scott's ego mm, right now maybe don't though because <laughs> what really dubs is like a good place to just be like oh my god look how simple solo is and it's great yeah well, but that, it'll ruin, that actually... it'll ruin him <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for other other decks that's actually yeah. a question i have with the, since we're talking state of the game um because yeah. i i mean i have played some solo but it's been a while i almost exclusively play multiplayer do you guys have mm-hmm. thoughts on that for where the game's at today for solo versus multiplayer and if mm. so like like which player mm. counts and big question that's going to keep going has your thought on that evolved over time Mm. Ooh, that's a meaty fucking question right there, boy. That's how I roll. <laughs> I'm also least equipped to answer it as I barely play solo. So I'm interested in your guys' thoughts. I'll say this. I think solo requires the mindset. And this is... I think some people stumble here. Is that just... Yep, a, just that's a, me. <laughs> yeah. Before you say it, I know it's me. Accepting that... One, sometimes you're going to get just absolutely throttled. Um, what? No, everything should be fair and even. Nope, that's not how solo rolls. It's just sometimes, and you know what, what Ian, when you mentioned, or was it Sean, when you're talking about like the, the encounter deck more mimics, like in Lord of the Rings, it's meant to mimic another player. In Arkham, it's mm-hmm. give you experience. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it feels much more like another player, and they're on the top of their game. Two, I think you also have to accept that, you know what, some there are just some cards and some strategies that don't work in solo. You can try them, you can push for them, and sometimes they'll push through, but I think you're going to have a bad time and not succeed more often than you succeed. And just to be able to say, you know what, 30% of the card pool is literally or almost literally unplayable in solo. Just accept that. Um Mm-hmm. Same thing with the investigators. Like honestly, like every investigator, I think, is probably capable of making their way through a solo campaign. But there are some that are just <laughs> the amount of pain you'll have to endure to do it, though. Like if you want to have a good time, well, it depends on what your idea of a good time is. is that that's also true. <laughs> is getting throttled your idea of a good time, and that's like, well, that's Arkham. Awesome. <laughs> have I? <laughs> I have a deck for you. Um, <laughs> There's like a million of them, but if you're if you're okay saying you know what like solo just takes a different mindset, a different strategy, and you have to like cut out thirty percent of the cards, including thirty percent of the investigators probably, um, <laughs> then then it's fine. But you have to be okay with that sacrifice, mm-hmm. and understanding that the game probably isn't always balanced for solo. Like it is a multiplayer game that we play solo. As much as I hate to say it and i disagree oh, with that mm, it feels mm, right sometimes no, say, say it again though say it again scott <laughs> no no well but I mean, you could <laughs> only also, once you could also frame that as it's primarily meant for multiplayer but mm-hmm. happen to play solo like i think that's where people get hung up on it i from what i've seen i generally agree it's more the multiplayer and hey we make it work solo that doesn't mm-hmm. mean that then it's purely a bad game solo or no it, it's just no. it's a different experience it is and okay. you have to think differently like as far as how you build your deck because you have to be able to cover everything you need to cover with enemy management and clues and you also have to very much accept that you're not going to be able to do everything in specific campaigns 
um, something like like the the Finn mentality, where it's like, you know what, I wouldn't use my willpower anyway, so I'm just gonna fail that and accept <laughs> it, right? Like you just have to tank some hits, or there's an optional objective over here. That's not happening. I'm not even going to try because it's, mm -hmm. it is like, do I want to commit five cards to one test that I'm like up by two or yeah. one to pass? No, that's stupid. Why would you ever do that? That is inefficient. Go do anything else, right? Like I'm still kind of like a, a solo journeyman. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but to my mind, the biggest difference is exactly what you're describing, Scott. Like, mm -hmm. you know, beyond like building your deck and, and, and that sort of thing which is its own consideration. When you're actually playing the game, one of the things that I struggle with most is where does my energy actually need to go right now mm -hmm. versus where do I wish it could go? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but it the, probably won't. The prioritizing an opportunity cost is huge. And mm. as the card pool, as far as how it's changed, as the card pool has expanded, like there are more tools in solo. Um, there are more mm -hmm. viable solo decks for sure. Mm -hmm. uh and each investigator has even the investigators that probably previously would say no chance in solo a lot of them have gotten more tools to be more doable um yep. so all of that is true at the same time i i find multiplayer um significantly easier than solo <laughs> um, especially yes. three or four player uh just it's just such a different mindset when like all the things you all are saying like it's almost like a minimalist mindset. I mean, it's one of the reasons why mm -hmm. I was attracted to the Rogue of Aid style in the first place. Because it's like, okay, first turn, even naked, I have no cards in play. I still have a way of dealing with enemies. Like, I can evade mm -hmm. them. And and that's I think that's part of other than just the theme of rogues and all that. That's and that's and that's still the case. Like I like I like the idea of investigators where no matter what my opening hand is or what happens, like I have some kind of outlet, hopefully to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, and that may take to different forms. It doesn't have to be evade, but you know, there there's different ways, but evades a good one though. Yeah. Uh -huh. But the biggest difference is just like, you have no pressure valve. No one else is going to come to save you. If something comes out, you can't deal with, no one's going to engage it off you or mm -hmm. or soak the damage for you or give you icons like it's all on you and so even in solo no one can hear you scream. <laughs> i was gonna say is ian describing solo arkham or capitalism <laughs> <laughs> or the cold embrace of the vacuum of space i mean yes to all <laughs> yeah. some might say D, all the above yeah <laughs> um but it even changes your decision making on individual turns like when you know that if you don't like pass that test on second or third action, no one's going to save you. And that enemy might just, you know, hit you for damage and horror. Like that changes mm -hmm. how many icons you commit, how like mm -hmm. what kind of decisions you make of what actions to take. So it's still the Often same you game. Just stand but... in place and draw. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I find in true solo is when I spend the most time being like, okay, I'm about to see some shit. Let's get some cards. <laughs> And even with just, like, being okay, like, that, yeah, you have all these cool cards in your deck, but there's a good chunk you probably won't have time to play, or, and just being okay with that. Like, what are the cards you really need to get out? God, and valuation mm -hmm. of cards. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Ian, this kind of speaks to what you just said, and also, I think, the again, the state of the game. If you had asked me two years ago, maybe, even, well, th yeah, two to three years ago, about solo, I believe I'm on record here saying, like, you just have to accept that 50% of the cards and investigators can't play solo. But now, I would say about 30%, because there's a bunch of investigators that got a lot of help with different cards that came out, mm -hmm. and there's other cards now that combo with other cards, like, because of the, the, the card pool is so large, there's a lot more options in solo. But your deck has to be so efficient. Like, there's no, huh, this is a fun card in solo. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to try this cute size strategy. No, no time. Yeah. Like, no time for fun. Yeah. So. I honestly, I find that to be a, a, one of my favorite features of the, the current card pool is evaluating it. Not only like solo versus everything else, but mm -hmm. really taking each player count as its own metagame, which yes. it absolutely is. 100%. Uh, 
Uh, like even even the weird one, which is three player, even three player has its own <laughs> the eccentricities. Weird one. Yes, yeah, it, yeah. it like really is because mm-hmm. it's it's not two handed, but it's not quite four player either. Yeah, especially as a seeker, because like there's a lot of three clue locations. You're like, mm-hmm. but all my things are in twos and are, fours. Are plus two. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So so like I'm going like, all right, do I play pilfer in a rogue and just like clear things that way, like. Uh, I, I feel like accounting for that and trying to be as efficient as possible to clear those clue counts at different player counts uh, is a very interesting metagame. Justin, I would I, love to be there when you play. Have you ever played solo? Uh, so just just really, really early in the game's life. Oh, man. Can we do like a Twitch stream where Justin plays solo and like the three of us sit on his shoulders and as judge him. Being <laughs> devils and angels? I, well, I kind of want to do what's that scene from Ghost with the pottery? You know, like I want to be behind Justin <laughs> also holding his hand while he holds his hand. You know what I mean? Like leaning over his shoulder. Yep. And now I'm just imagining the episode of Community where they. You, oh, that's where my mind <laughs> But yes, I'm on. I'm I'm in theory on board. I think it'd be fun. <laughs> I I would love to like, like coach you your first game and be like, hey, this, like or like as much as much, um, not assistance but coaching no, as I, you'd I, like. I think we really need to have that be where we kick off the Twitch stream where I play through and then you are actually commentating in the background of like, well, man, that was a rough bull, but I certainly wouldn't have done that if I was him. Yeah. <laughs> Look, uh, I personally, as a as an aspiring solo player, would benefit from from such a thing. So I don't think it's a terrible mm-hmm. content idea. Right. I will add right. it to the the laundry list of <laughs> ideas we have. Yes. Okay. So, like, oh my God, there we could talk. We could do this for several episodes. Um, but I, I think at this point we should probably kind of go around the table. Uh, kind of what, what is your like favorite or first or most prominent thing that comes to your mind when you talk about the current state of the game, uh, and, and where it's all at? Hmm. I can start with that. What do you all think? Go on. Yeah. Um, I, I describe it to people as it's very accessible. Um, I, you guys know, I, I approach a lot of this from, even though I rarely describe myself as super casual anymore but i still think about it from the casual standpoint because of some of the people i play with or who i i tell about the game you're like right smack dab in the middle right i love how accessible it, it has become because if if you could teleport me back six years um other than the investments i would make um i would warn myself about hey you're gonna love this game but when you sit down with that box for the first time and try and figure it out yourself, you're going to have a bad time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not because it, it's actually, it's very, it has a very good system to learn, but I came from a much more casual background and I was brought in by theme. Now there are so many resources, both official and otherwise, then you have things like those starter decks. They're just so great. Um, I describe it to people as if you ha- are even remotely interested in it and you want something that's a little meatier as a game, go for it. It's awesome. Dive in. And I just, I, even a couple years ago, I don't know that I could have confidently said that, but now I really can. And that's the piece to me that stands out. Um, I think my perspective might be a little bit more from kind of, kind of a meta level. And we didn't even really talk about it in our, in our state of the game discussion, but the, change in the way that the game is being released i think is going to have a a pretty big impact on the way that new people come in and experience and play and find cards in the game so that's going to be interesting to to continually track but where we sit in the game now i just am continually staggered by how creative the uh, the scenarios can get and the different enemy design and I know that the Scarlet Keys looks amazing and like Nick's going to do a great job whenever we like in three or four years or however much <laughs> lead time see. it takes to yeah. produce this game. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be fun. Um, I just uh, and, and you know, the, the Cthulhu mythos is somewhat finite, but also at the same time, very open ended. 
Uh, I feel like the way that FFG has has adapted the the setting, there are lots of kind of like fixed tropes and and you know, specific things that that are kind of you know endemic to the setting. But also, we've seen so much how how like the the boundaries can be expanded and like weird we can do weird shit. Like, I I hope this game continues to get developed for you know ten plus more years. A boy can dream. Uh, uh, I think it's possible, so so we'll see. But I, I only remain hopeful for the the future of the game because I think it's in a great spot for how old it is. Um, I can I can go, and this might be like because originally I was thinking that one of the things that I, uh, that I most think of when I think of the current state of the game is just. <clears throat> how many different ways there are to play in terms of decks Mm. in terms of there's so many investigators now and each one is like a um a mini like agenda and in game of thrones or contract and lord (laughs) of the rings like it just like shapes Mm -hmm. how the deck works uh but then my mind went to i think to even though this isn't as much gameplay related i think it's it's something that i love about the game is how uh diverse it's become in terms of like characters and representation like to be honest arkham files characters like i i love all the old arkham files characters uh but a lot of them are very tropey um a lot of them are like the classic like uh old white like professor or um adventurer of some kind and I love that they've not been afraid to add more and more characters who represent all kinds of different identities and just give people something to represent them in the game and also expand the vision of like what by expanding this vision of this kind of like fictional version of the past, I think it also ex- expands the vision of the present and what's possible. Um, and And I think, it's something like that makes me proud to be a player in the game and a content producer for the game to, to know that that's happening and that's important to the design team. And, uh, yeah, I think I'll get off my soapbox there, but I, I, it, yeah, I get, I guess more than anything, like it, it just, it just helps enhance everything that's part of the game and, and knowing that as our podcast and our members of the community that were part of that whole picture as well. Mm-hmm. I, I love being a hype person for this game because I mm-hmm. am hyped about it. Yeah. Right? Like it's 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 very easy to do. <laughs> Arkham is for everybody, TM. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, we would never put a trademark. Yeah. On Arkham is for everybody. <laughs> yeah. This is true. <laughs> that goes completely against Arkham is for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty great though. Yeah. Um I am just absolutely amazed every time i involve myself or poke my head in on this community and this game um the game is absolutely fantastic i feel like it's the card game i most want to be involved with like when i was growing up i was super into the star wars ccg but i was a kid and i I wasn't very good at it and Mm -hmm. i didn't have the money to buy it and all these other things um if i had been an adult during that time I think I would have gone like, you know, nipple deep going feet first, whatever. Anyways, um, (laughs) just wait. So in in your Scrooge McDuck (laughs) fantasy, you weighed carefully up to your nipples in your cards. Is that how that works? Yes. I don't want to. Okay. Like if you jump into them, you might bend them and break or (laughs) fold them, right? Because that's the concern. Crease them. (laughs) Um, And it just... I am now at a point in my life to be involved in this game and in this community. And also the game is absolutely fantastic. There is no such thing as a perfect game, but damn it. Arkham comes pretty damn close. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And I'm always excited about what's coming out. And like, even like this preview season, I'm super hyped. Like every single card, I'm like, Oh my God, I have 14 more decks to go build now. Right? Like it just, it, it constantly, the way Maxine just constantly changes how we approach the game, it just feels like, and I, I feel like there's a lot of games that people say about this where you can do anything in this game. And I mean, it's limited within 
I mean, Arkham and and how a card game functions, but almost not anymore. Like, there's so many weird interaction stuff, and I just love that exploration space where it feels like it's like Breath of the Wild, where I can just be running around, doing whatever I want, how I want to do it, but in the scenario. And as far as the state of the game, like the fact that that exists now, and I would say existed probably about a year and a half ago, but now I feel like we're solidly in that now. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, and when you combine that with how it's uh, so effective at being a balance between being a card game and a role-playing game, Right. Yeah. So and also depending board on how game heavy, too, you know, yeah, like, depending on yeah. how much you want to lean into each of those elements, that's another way it can expand. Mm-hmm. But even like just the way we can solve issues in scenarios, even going back to stuff like Dunwich, you know, like there's mm-hmm. just so many fun ideas you can bring back and be like, oh, I have to kill this bad guy. Well, I can actually do that by going over to this location and spending clues on my card to like do this thing, and yeah, it's it's insane. I yep. love it. So I don't know. Like that's not, su- that's not super technical or whatever, but that's the state of the <laughs> game to me. It's just, that's cool. I don't know. It's like, you're you allowed said, to have real human emotions too. I like being a hype guy. Uh, cause I'm, <laughs> I'm hype about this game. There's nothing fake about it. Um, I have said negative things about this game. I am very honest and I will tell you them, but they are few and far between. Yeah. Yeah. All right, boys. Well, I'm sure we'll, we'll return to this topic at some point. Uh, but, as we round this episode out, let's turn it into a little bit of high and tight tentacle time. So, Ian, what's been grabbing you lately? Well, quite a few things, but I'll narrow it down to, uh, I think both me and Scott have mentioned it in recent episodes, mm-hmm. getting back into Netrunner. And uh, there's been a new Netrunner, very casual league started on the Mythos Busters Discord. So if that's, if that's something you're interested in trying, um, what is the channel called? Netrunner Night at the Clover Club. Um, <laughs> and you can, it, it's super casual. Most of us are pretty new to the game or haven't played in a long time. You can drop in and out um, along the way. It's not like you're keeping like hardcore. It's, it's league in a loose sense. It's more just a chance to play games. But anyway. Where were you guys six years ago when I actually had time and space for <laughs> Netrunner? <laughs> Like I'm watching you guys play, and I'm I'm very very happy for you. But also I'm like I'm I'm doing that Doctor Who in the rain through mm. the window. <laughs> well, come and, join us, Sean. Yeah, anytime <laughs> you want to play, Sean. Um, no, that's the problem. I don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> but who should be paired together in the first week of the league? But Scott, yeah, and I. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which was great, and much to Ian's chagrin. We both run. We both won with our corp decks. So yep, yeah, yay corporation nice. the runners. We we split yeah. the games because those not familiar with Netrunner, you play two games. One is the corp, one is runner. Uh, so I won one game. Scott won one. Um, b- both of our corp decks won. So yeah, hmm. but that was that was a lot of fun. Like and I, it was. I I'm I'm looking forward to the chance to play more Netrunner and and getting back back into it and really like starting to learn more and more of the cards and yeah and 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 just of it i think one of the big obstacles for me is um has always been for netrunner that it is such a big learning curve that like having to play Mm -hmm. games against people who are very know the game well is tough but this kind of casual environment like where we all know we're not like taking it too seriously helps but yeah, I was what? I was playing Wayland Corp and uh, Tenma Runner, and Scott was playing what? NBN and Tenma Runner. What pool are you guys playing with? The new mm. Nisei stuff? Yeah, the startup. Mm. It's called. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Startup I still have that. not even looked at that. It's got a lot of reprints from mm-hmm. FFG stuff, but also new stuff. But it's also like just basic, like down back to basics kind of thing. It feels like sure. It's supposed um, to be like a core set, right? Yeah, Maybe but there's the first part of it. They've had like two cycles out now past their course. Okay. Um, okay. I don't know. It's still young in the in the, mm-hmm. the yes. life cycle of an LCG. Yeah, because if we were jumping in and learning like all of Netrunner, I think I'd have a different different experience. But since this <laughs> yeah. this is it like, would be brain burn. This is like jumping into Arkham, like halfway through Carcosa. Sure. Right? Like it's still new enough, like you can go back and learn all the cards. 
Fuck, so, so that means the window's closing before I become, like, straight up irrelevant? God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> Join us. Mm. I'll build I mean, you a deck. It'll be yeah, shit, the card pool so. thing helps a lot, because that was the <laughs> other big obstacle, is, like, card knowledge is so important in Netrunner. Like, yes. Like, trying yes. to, like, learn hundreds of cards at once versus, like, it feels pretty manageable to... And and still an interesting enough variety that I was like, okay, I can try this deck, or I can try this out. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's fun. Technical mm-hmm. time, mine was going to be Netrunner as well. And <laughs> my return to it actually was uh, Mr. Trench and I, because of my shift schedule, like sometimes I'm off in the middle of the day and no one else is, and Mr. Trench is home, and I'm like, awesome, let's play card games. And we were playing uh, a bunch of Conquests, and I was like, let's play Netrunner. Let's play it on Jinteki. Like, why not? Like, I want to play this game because it seems fun. And so we were playing, like, casual games but we could use any deck like we just went on netrunner db and just grabbed sure. decks I'm yeah not sure of legality ban lists, <laughs> yeah. card pools uh, i was just like <laughs> like hall of fame something recent slam it into jinteki and see what happens um i don't think i've won a single game against him uh, <laughs> he, he also used to play netrunner so he mm-hmm. understands the ebb and flow yeah. of netrunner but ian i was gonna reference your jenny deck okay uh, bold but true. Uh, your your Jenny deck is essentially a runner deck because you have to get <laughs> all your pieces of Icebreaker out, which are like the relic and the skill boosters. Yeah, and then you you use your your resources or your credits to boost your mm. skills to break tests. Hmm. Hmm. That makes sense to me. I I, I was driving one day. I'm like, holy crap! It feels the same. <laughs> Because you get your things out, that's all your icebreakers, and then you have like your mountain of credits, and then you pay credits each test to break the test, which is yeah. the ice. That makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, it's really neat. Like, uh, I'm I'm actually having a lot of fun on the corp side of Netrunner. Mm. I find Runner so hard because I don't know what's going on. That's the thing. Like, corp is like do 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 build my stuff, protect it, whereas Runner is like I need how to figure out like how to get to those things and there's barriers and things i need to cross through and i need to draw those cards whereas corp it's like do 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 advance advance score score do 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 so i don't know <laughs> yeah the beep, the pacing beep, boop, and just the way of like thinking in that runner is so interesting and i watched a couple of uh like new player videos which were very helpful like i'm still far mm. away from being anything close to good at the game but some basic things were helpful like um like planning out your actions in advance like Mm. drawing as your first action so you have more options available of what you're gonna do yeah and those are different things if i draw as my first action and i get a new option then all of my plans go away (laughs) well that that was that was kind of the point of the video i was watching like because if you like let's say you you play something down and then you draw a second action well that might have been a better thing to do or it might have been sure. something that might be a better option for the run but i think we watched the same video by the way yeah <laughs> yeah similar. yeah, yeah. I, I am just totally still i wish i would have thought to like find then if someone knows in chat because I'm, I'm just totally cribbing from that video completely but because the other thing was like using runs as information like just go mm-hmm. in naked on a run to find out what the ice is like you know it might yeah. be something bad but it's like, neural katana yeah yeah but it K- gives you information K- so <laughs> but ian i did that against you and you trashed my only icebreaker program and then my game that just floundered true. and then you won so I, yeah you disregard. i wouldn't recommend doing that against the corp deck <laughs> <laughs> I, I, there, there was always a risk inherent to it which yeah. is what makes it an interesting game yeah. mm-hmm. i say as if i knew how to play it <laughs> <laughs> well you should come play with ian and i because we're probably easy pickings uh, i'm about to start a new job so we'll see what my uh my brain space allows me but okay. I, I want to yeah. i really want to mm-hmm. so i hope that means something you can hear bit. the genuine struggle in your voice <laughs> i hope because it's there justin what's grabbing you uh not a ton lately purely because time constraints uh but when i have had time for stuff uh you and i along with some of our other friends have been playing uh shredder's revenge 
Yeah, you do. New side scrolling. Uh, well, new ish. I've probably come out a little bit ago, and we're just getting to it. Uh, Turtles game, and it's delightful. Uh, looking forward to playing more of that and then getting into the other Turtles collection that comes out, I think, next month. Uh, oh, is it that soon? I think Damn. so. Um, but yeah, no, that's that's been really fun. I, I always enjoy the, the button mashy side scrollers and it's they have enough content that it's not just, oh, hey, I played that for an hour and then I ne- I'm never playing it again. Uh, so that's been fun. The other thing I've been doing is um, I'm going to talk about Keyforge again. <laughs> uh, when Asmodee sold Keyforge to Ghost Galaxy, uh, they also clearanced out all of their stock of decks, and I, I, they were a dollar a deck uh, for everything oh, ex- wow. except the most recent set. I believe they still uh-huh. have those. Um, so every- thank you for that tip, by the way, as like mass mutation is by far my favorite set. I was able to get like a two and a half boxes for like $30. Yeah. It was fantastic. Yeah. So I have been, uh, I've been cracking some, uh, packs of that just while I'm watching TV, just sort of looking through them. Haven't had much of a chance to play, uh, but been doing that and then laying plans to get, uh, our Keyforge league started up again. For those who don't know, I, uh, I don't know. I'm the commissioner. Is that a, a right word, Sean? I think. Um, yeah, I, absolutely. It is. I am the commissioner of a small, uh, unofficial Keyforge league that uh, we we get decks that were, you know previously played. I reseal them in uh, foil packets, and then we uh, we play for prizes. So I'm getting getting ready to start that up again now that summer's. I hate to say it, but starting to wind down. But then we're uh, we're able to play it again. I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be fun. I, I pulled a ridiculous, I think it, like, probably the most ridiculous de- deck that I have pulled from Keyforge out of that set, and whew, I'm excited to actually try that out in person at some point. Uh, as for me, I've been playing a little bit of Marvel here and there, mostly Arkham. Um, on the video game side, I finally, truly, in a dedicated manner, cracked back into Hades. Hmm. That makes me so happy. That is such uh, like I'm I'm glad I did because I I have picked it up like three separate times, and have put like I feel like I'd put like thirty hours into it before this most recent time. So I'd put time into it. I enjoyed it, uh, but really being like okay, I'm going to beat Hades now, made a difference, um, and I have at this point beaten Hades, and I'm now into the the post game where you can add all the difficulty modifiers and and like level up all the stuff and. And just kind of have fun with it. Uh, fantastic game. Uh, if you enjoy, t- like, God, I-, I feel like the other two of you, if you haven't played it yet, both of you, I believe, would enjoy it. It is a Greek mythology based rogue like. Is it a rogue like or a rogue light? I'm still not sure. I like, think what it's the difference rogue like. Ro- I would. Rogue- I feel like I. I think rogue it's a rogue light. Because it has persistent elements. Rogue like that's, yes. that's the difference. Yeah, yes, rogue like yeah. is pure. You go through each run is then scrub, but because there is some, or there are mm-hmm. some things that stick, it's light. Yeah. So so you know I, I you know we've talked about Returnal on the podcast before. This hits a very similar spot where you're like you're making these runs and you're getting random weapons and modifiers and and whatnot uh, throughout the run that kind of like shape the way you play. And like, eventually you hit something that kind of breaks the game and then you do eventually beat the game. Uh, And like, it's so fun. And Greek mythology is like my jam. I, I like mythology in general, but I have never dived so deep into a mythology as I have into Greek mythology. And it's not like they go super deep into Hades, but it's like presented a little bit more on like the, um, I want to say kind of like almost a, a, like a Japanese type game where the characters just kind of have character lines and it's presented in a very just matter of fact kind of way. And there are so many voice lines. Uh, uh, just such a good game. Well, and, it, and it, it, it's presented a little it's a little thirsty, too. Yeah, there's that, too. Like <laughs> as a practicing bisexual can confirm. 
Um, the the other thing I would say is that on Switch in particular, because this is on like every platform you could hope to buy it on now. Mm-hmm. On Switch, it is a fantastic game because it is perfect for that kind of play where you pick it up run through a couple of levels for five minutes and oh the kids need something or, or dinner needs preparing or like whatever it is you put it down uh and pick it back up later i i can't say enough good things about hades i've enjoyed mm-hmm. every game that i've played from super giant uh, i played bastion i played uh transistor was was kind of the front runner up to this point oh such a uh, good but game. hades oh okay if transistor. you like transistor you would love hades so much but hades I is all fast you. transistor transistor is like turn-based ah uh, okay that's true like, that's true like 80 percent of the interaction with the game is different <laughs> well no i mean it does rely a more on your twitch reflexes but the the play styles that you can cultivate between the different weapons in the game don't always demand that your like twitch reflexes be on point Okay. It is it is it is twitchier, but it's not like Dark Souls type twitchy. Where oh, yeah, I right. forgot a dodge here, I'm cooked. It's mm-hmm. it is a faster game, but you can also get different effects and other things with your weapons where that matters less. So, and I feel like the the different boons and bonuses that you can just kind of like randomly acquire throughout a run, uh, they offer you a lot of variety. So depending on what you perceive your weaknesses or your play style to be. Um, you can really kind of play toward that. Mm. But anyway, I had a blasty blast with Hades. I'm not quite done with it yet, but uh, I had a, had a really good time. Highly recommended. I know I'm like three years late 